morning, everybody. Okay, well, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the Northern Transport Summit today. Um, we've obviously, you know, we've had our new Northern leaders elected. We are cautiously coming out of lockdown. We've heard from the William Shapps review, and um, we're all sitting waiting with basic breath of the ILP. So this is a really timely opportunity to look at um, how we're going to build back better transport for the North and connect people and places. I'd like to thank the sponsors, WSP, Atkins, Arriva, Transport Focus and Transport for the North for their support. Um, before we get started, I'm going to run through um, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, so just to let you know that the Northern Transport Summit is being recorded and it will be shared online in due course. Uh, mini summits are going to run separately, but you do require separate booking and a link. So registration is going to be open until 12 o'clock. If you've not already booked and you want to join one of the four excellent mini summits, closing and the closing plenary, then please click on the link in the chat, which I believe will show in the chat now. Um, throughout the morning, um, we'd like you to share your comments and questions in the chat all the way through the event, and these will be addressed by our panels as we work our way through the morning. So we've got an absolutely fantastic agenda. Um, we've got just, I think, a phenomenal lineup of speakers. I was so impressed and so nervous at the fact when I saw when I saw the great lineup of speakers that we've got today. Um, and there's a number of key questions that we want to answer through the course of the morning. Um, we've got, we've obviously, as I mentioned before, you know, we've had the William Shatt's Great British Railways. What's that going to mean? There's a bus back better strategy, um, and we need to consider what that's going to mean for us. The net zero am ambitions, and these have all been really accelerated, quite rightly probably, in the run-up to COP26. We do need to look like we are leading the way. Um, and we're, as, as I mentioned before, we're awaiting the integrated rail plan. And then there's always that topic as well, and I, one that I find quite interesting, the Northern Transport Acceleration Unit. So I've heard John Cridlin speak very eloquently, explaining how it's not, um, it's not in conflict with the Transport for the North's agenda or the Northern Powerhouse Rail. But then every time I go away from that, I, and I, I'm always convinced that every time I go away, and then start thinking, how is it not in conflict? So that's a really interesting thing that we're going to be covering um, over hopefully the course of a lot of the conversations today. So it's my great pleasure to introduce David Sidebottom. He's the Director of Transport Focus. And um, Tim Wood, who many of you will know is currently the Interim Chief Executive of Transport for the North. Um, and they're gonna open today's summit and set the scene and provide some context for us. Each of them is gonna share their thoughts, give us some insight into the state of the North, where we are now, ambitions, overview of passenger confidence and concerns, and where we need to be and why transport is so important to leveling up in the green recovery. So our first session is the State of the North, and I'm pleased to introduce, um, to talk to us initially, David Sidebottom, Director of Transport Focus. Hi there, good morning. Thanks, Debbie. Great introduction to what's going to be, hopefully, a, a fantastic day. I'm sure it will be a fantastic day. Uh, really privileged that Transport Focus has been asked to be part of this session. We're, we're very pleased to sponsor it and been helping working with Devo Connect and Transport for the North and getting today's uh, agenda together. Um, Transport Focus, for those that don't know, we're the statutory independent consumer watchdog for Britain's transport users. Uh, very strong roots in the North. I'm sat here in sunny Stockport this morning, so um, welcome from the North of England. Um, we're very much a consumer-based organisation. We want to be useful to governments, transport authorities and transport operators, and we do that by providing evidence through research and policy development work, talking to those that use public transport and our roads at the moment, as well as those people that find barriers to using public transport in the future. Uh, this summit will naturally do a lot of looking forward, which is very important. I think as part of that, though, I also want to just have a quick look back over our shoulder and as, as Debbie said I think building back better part of that is restoring trust and confidence in public transport which um, has seen its challenges let's be fair over these over these past uh, 14 months or so of the pandemic it's been incredibly resilient incredibly flexible and adaptable in getting back to welcoming more people back to using our buses trams and trains in, in, in more recent weeks and months but during the pandemic at Transport Focus, we've been looking at the, the attitudes and experiences of people using our roads, and perhaps more importantly, in, in, in the context of uh, today's summit, our buses, trams and trains. So understanding those people who've been uh, using public transport throughout the pandemic, those people that have stopped using public transport and why, 
and what their priorities and needs are for the future. There's still a job to do, even though we are seeing more people coming back to using our trains and buses and trams, which is really encouraging. Throughout the pandemic, broadly speaking, nine out of 10 uh, public transport users have felt safe or very safe in relation to coronavirus while using public transport, which is great and testament to the hard work of everybody in delivering those services. But when you ask those people that have not used public transport, if they were to plan a journey in the near future, that level of confidence falls by about half. That gap has been closing ever so slightly in recent weeks, and there's still a job to do as we uh, help build confidence back. As I mentioned, the sectors have been working incredibly hard to build that confidence. So we've seen you know, things like the enhanced cleaning, making sure there's as much safe social distancing space as we can possibly provide on public transport and things like new technology so people can track through websites and particularly apps to see how busy their bus or train may be and other information provision and new ticketing uh, intervention so people can buy contactless or buy off uh, buy away from a more traditional method which is really good in helping build that confidence we talk an awful lot though about the decline in regular commuting and there seems to be some debate you know we hear from national politicians that we're expecting more people to come back and i'm sure there's some there's something in that but we've been asking people who were regular commuters about what they anticipate to do in the future and uh, you know there's, there's quite a stark gap to fill there i think at the moment we'll see what the reality is but around three quarters of people who used our trains for example on four or five days a week, expect to travel a lot less, some one day a week, two days a week, but with that spread over three days as well. And what do they want? They want this long sought after flexible season ticket, ticket bundles, ticket carnets, call them what you will. And they want a discount that helps them feel as though they're not being penalized for traveling just that one or two day a week when perhaps 14, 15 months ago, they were using um, weekly, monthly or annual season tickets. And the same applies to the bus as well. And actually, we've got some new research coming out uh, next month where we've been talking to bus passengers across the north of England, across Great Britain, about what they want as they come back to using our buses. And I think we're already seeing some bus operators reporting around about 66%, 70% of passengers back on buses now, which is great. But what do people want when they come back? And people are clearly telling us that what they want is some sort of fares incentive. We're seeing one or two bus operators in the north already giving away sort of three day travel to get people back on. That's great. But we want to see more of that um, across the north as people come back to using bus. But the one thing throughout all this, and I, th and I remember talking to um, uh, the team at Devo Connect about this event probably a year or two ago now. The thing that's still true now uh, throughout the pandemic is people want a reliable, punctual public transport system that provides good value for money. That's been true throughout the pandemic. They value that, and that's got to be a key focus, I think, of today's event, making sure we focus on that. We love the politics and the investment and the infrastructure build and all the stuff that makes these summits what they are. But we've got to keep at the back of our minds that people who use public transport value it because it delivers those things on a more, reg on a more regular basis. People choose public transport because of cost and convenience. We've got to keep that at the back of our minds. And just a little look ahead for me before I wrap up, really, I think, you know, certainly on rail, we've got the ambitions and the reality of the Trans-Pennine route upgrade getting closer and cr closer now. We've got some tough decisions that are going to emerge from the uh, Manchester Recovery Task Force. And we need to make sure that the, that the new joined up railway delivers on those, on those important factors for passengers, making sure that the disruption that that will in inevitably bring to some people's daily journeys is managed effectively through good communication and solid delivery and consistent delivery by, by a, a better joined up railway. Transport Focus has worked hard with Transport for the North, Network Rail and Train Operators to understand what rail passengers want from the Trans-Pennine routes upgrade in terms of managing that disruption and we stand by to help in making sure we can track that throughout the, the, those important areas of work. As Debbie mentioned, the National Bus Strategy is launched now. There's a lot of feverish work going on between uh, local transport authorities and bus operators to make sure they set up the partnerships that deliver for passengers. And, of course, the Greater Manchester's bus franchising plans will we'll, we'll hope to rejuvenate bus travel uh, beyond where we were in terms of pre-pandemic levels, but making sure it's delivered more consistently. And that's not about sort of dumbing it down to a, to a lower level. It's making sure that the kind of excellent bus service we see in many of our towns and cities across the north is replicated uh, even further. 
And finally, I just want to just re remind everybody, of course, that transport's about people, passengers, consumers, customers, call them what you will. But I think I just want to finish by thanking all those transport workers who over the past 14 months or so of the pandemic have made sure that it's kept us all moving, kept us moving safely. And it's not just the frontline delivery that have done a very great job in very tough circumstances, but those people behind the scenes who have been doing the scheduling, the timetable and the planning, the engineering, making sure that it's kept us all moving. And I think that's a great testament to the sector. So I'll, I'll stop there and um, hand back to Debbie and I hope you get as much from today uh, as I'm hoping to get from today as well. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, David. Yeah, so much of what you're saying sort of resonates when you think about things from a passenger point of view. Because although we all sit here as industry experts, we also probably need to remember the vast majority of us, I believe, are also, you know, um, commuters on public transport. You know, there's very few people I know around this industry who take part in these type of things, who use the car as a matter of choice. In always, and I know many people might have seen I tweeted last week because I was back on the trains for a while, and it, and I understand the difficulty about getting that balance of, you know, we don't have the passengers, so how can we afford to keep the services open? But I remember being slightly disgruntled tweeter last week because, um, you know, there was no catering on any of the stations I was at, there was no catering on any trains I was at. It's like, okay, so how do we, you know, we want to entice passengers back. How do we do that? And and I think I'm obviously really interested that we get to a panel on your views maybe on, on how the William Shouty view might make those huge improvements that are needed to the passenger ticketing um, and the actual, you know, journey costs and journey simplicity, simplicity of that pricing almost. It'd be interesting if we get a chance to the panel to hear your views on that. So thank you. Okay, so next this morning, um, I'd like to introduce, he doesn't probably need very much introduction, but I'm going to do it anyway, Tim Wood. He's currently the Interim Chief Executive of Transport for the North, and he's going to speak to you now. Welcome, Tim. Thank you, Debbie, and good morning, everyone. It's an absolute privilege to be speaking at today's Northern Transport Summit. The agenda is packed and throughout we'll explore questions that are key to our region's economic recovery and the future prosperity of the north of England, as well as levelling up. It's no exaggeration to say that we're at a critical moment in the Norse history. This summer is momentum going forward, really important that we can plot our journey out of some of the most challenging times we've had in living memory. The announcement last week that Great British Railways will bring back train and track together as a guiding mind, putting passengers first is significant and something we've really championed in Transport for the North. This is a major national moment and a shift in how the railways run, but this national approach must not be a missed opportunity for further devolution giving those Norse leaders a greater oversight over services and infrastructure investment to deliver a more integrated regional network that works for all. The commitment to growing and investing in the railway over the next 30 years only emphasises the real need for the government to push to publish the integrated rail plan for the North and Midlands without delay, to give us much needed clarity on the delivery of those major schemes like Northern Powerhouse Rail, HS2, and Trans Pennine route upgrade. As an established and effective partnership in the north of England, Transport for the North will collaboratively engage with government as it begins to work through the detail, and we stand ready to drive positive change in the interests of our passengers. And that is both passengers and freight. While last week's news is really welcome, we're still, of course, awaiting the government to publish its landmark report on rail investment, that integrated rail plan. This promises to spell out how the country will be levelled up through a complete refit of the Norse Rail Network. The infrastructure investment decisions taken over the next few weeks and months may well define the Norse prospects for the next century and into the next. That is how pivotal this is. This is not the time to scale back on ambition. This is the time to be bold, to commit to rail interventions that will unlock the unparalleled potential of our great cities and towns in the North. The leaders of North have a vision for this region, a vision for a well-connected North of England with a state-of-the-art rail network enabling it to become a better fertility for jobs and economic growth. The North has the potential to make a seismic stride forward in the years ahead. The success of London and the South East is undoubted, but that very success brings with it the issues of overcrowding, expensive property, a squeeze on resources and living standards. By contrast, the North can offer space 
beautiful upland areas of outstanding natural beauty, cheaper housing and rents, and a highly educated workforce and specialist manufacturers. It is really true for ripe and ready for expansion and growth. It's happened before. The north of England was the birthplace of the railways, and that age of intervention and inventions really accompanied with the region's move towards the industrial powerhouse of Britain and, of course, of the world. But today, the Norse Railways is a creaking at the seams as a result of decades of underinvestment compared to the south of the England and our industrial competitors around the developed world. Intercity connections among the urban centres of the north are poor. Our wealth of young people are constrained in the jobs and opportunities they can reach for from their local area. Northern Powerhouse Rail absolutely changes this by revolutionising capacity, frequency and the speed of the train services between the north major urban areas. This transformational set of interventions will open up opportunities, kick-starting and upturning the fortune of people and businesses in the region. Early this year, council and city region leaders in the north, speaking with one voice through Transport for the North, unanimously agreed to the preferred network for Northern Powerhouse Rail. The network is a mix of new lines and major upgrades, including electrification from Liverpool in the west to Hull in the east. It will feature a new line from Manchester to Leeds via the centre of Bradford, significant upgrades and journey time improvements to the Hope Valley route between Manchester and Sheffield, a new connection from Sheffield to HS2 and on to Leeds, significant upgrades in electrification of the lines between Leeds and Sheffield, Sheffield to Hull, and a new line to be constructed from Liverpool to Manchester via the centre of Warrington, and significant upgrades on the East Coast main line from Leeds to Newcastle, by York and Darlington, and the restoration of the Leem side line. It would see journey times between Manchester and Leeds slashed to just 30 minutes, with six high-speed services every hour, compared to just four trains currently. Committed to in full, NPR will deliver up to $14.4 billion per year in total gross value add to the economy of the North by 2060. Around 74,000 new jobs in the North by 2060, and an additional 12,250 seats per peak hour in the morning travel. It promises a greener future too, with up to 58,000 cars taken off our roads every day. The job market for employers and employees will be widened beyond comparison across the region, particularly for those in and around the key station areas. Take Liverpool, for example. Two million more people and 56,000 additional businesses will be within 90 minutes reach of the region. This transformational impact will be replicated across the north, opening up job opportunities, attracting investment, and ultimately stimulating economic growth. Growth. Make no mistake, this is badly needed rail investment over the coming decades, which will be the north's single biggest transport investment since the Industrial Revolution. It's a long-term solution to correct what has become a really serious national imbalance in our economy caused by decades of underinvestment. The impact of the programme will be transformational, not only for rail connectivity in the region, but also for the economy, the environment and for people's quality of life. That is why the government should commit to the full transformational vision for Northern Powerhouse Rail and the full HS2 routes, including Sheffield and Leeds. Getting to this point in development has been truly a collaborative effort, reached by working in partnership with the Department for Transport, HS2 Limited, Network Rail and local transport authorities. We are on the cusp of securing the right solutions for the North, which will be really benefiting our economy for the next 100 years. While Northern Powerhouse Rail is our single biggest project, we also need to focus on how we deliver other important parts of transport. Last year, our board members approved the Northern Transport Charter to set out their vision for the future of the organisation. And this is very much embodied in our business plan for the forthcoming year. It draws on our focus to understanding how we can deliver a more sustainable future. We will be consulting on our decarbonisation strategy this summer and how the North can take a leading role in prioritising and delivering of these projects and ensure passengers are at the heart of everything we do. We have an excellent technical analysis and modelling team that have not only strengthened our case for Northern Powerhouse Rail, who have been working on the understanding that the wider transport benefits investment as a whole, but both economic and social ones. That's why we say to government, we've done the work together, now let's live, deliver together for the North, let's deliver Northern Powerhouse Rail, 
and the rest of the investment the North needs. The time is now. This is the time we build back better. Thank you, Debbie. Thanks so much, Tim. And um, obviously, I'm ready to almost applaud some of that. You're right. This is not the time for us to uh, to scale back on our ambition in any shape or form. And you've really sort of echoed a lot of what I know you already know my thoughts are. But historically, as you said, you know, I mean, we we um, we were at the heart of the rail revolution. We were at the heart of the industrial revolution. Why can't we be at the heart of the great British growth revolution? Um, and I think, you know, there are a lot of points you've made there, you know, about the, the lifestyle, the, the ability to maybe potentially balance out some of the excessive house prices in the country. COVID's teaching people that there might be a different way to live and work. And the North offers a great opportunity for people for that. But only if, of course, we can connect when we need to connect with with the right in you know in the right type of time and it's not going to take hours. I think many of us will have seen the um, the great little clip. Um, I suppose I can advertise him because he's a mayor. The great little clip Andy did straight after he got his election. Where he did a three and a half minute video clip showing how long it can take and how much it cost to get from one part of Manchester over to Salford. I think it was over to Salford Keys he was going and the huge cost of that. And and the time it took was less than eight miles, and it took an hour and a quarter because because everything has to go in and out as opposed to you know nothing going around. And many of the plans not only connect our greater cities but also help us connect around those cities as well. And this is where the buses obviously also play a very key part in that. And as you said, you know we've got a really big environmental agenda. Well, rail and buses are are a huge answer to some of the issues that we've got there. So. I look forward to, to hearing more from you when we get to the panel. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, okay, so we've now got, um, I'm going to introduce, him. he's not here in person, unfortunately, as, he's, as he was unable to be, um, but he really did want to be part of the Northern Transport Summit, and he's provided a pre-recorded keynote contribution. So we'll just listen to um, Sir John Armas, who was chairman of the National Infrastructure. Good morning, everyone. And uh, I'm sorry I cannot be with you today, but uh, wish you all the best with your uh, conference. Uh, well, let's start, of course, with our passengers, which are who are, of course, the most critical uh, element of any transport system. The first thing that needs to happen is for the government to, when the time is right, need to change its messaging and lift the remaining restrictions. I don't for a minute want to second guess what is going to be the right time for that. Uh, plenty of people are doing that all the time. But it will make an important moment when the whole industry can wholeheartedly shout from the rooftops that the network is safe to use at the capacities that we were previously used to. I'm attracted to some of the policy ideas that I've heard to encourage passengers back. Not only more flexible season tickets, but the idea of some cut price fares to ride out to help out. They're all worthy of exploration. One of the challenges of rail, of course, is that people on the one hand want to know that they've got a consistent approach to ticketing, which makes it difficult to then experiment. But from my experience at National Express, there's no doubt that uh, the ability to be able to experiment, try things out and uh, put them up, withdraw them if they don't work, is quite critical to finding the best way in which we can attract people onto public transport. By the time of your conference, we may well have, of course, heard from governments as to what their plans are for rail governance going forward and changes to the structure of the industry. And that's an another opportunity to introduce ways to uh, attract more passengers. I'd like to offer a word of encouragement. The government, uh, the Commission, sorry, has recently looked at a number of scenarios for how COVID-related behaviour shifts might persist over the longer term. Our main insight is that short-term intentions and actions are not a reliable guide to how things may look in 20 to 30 years' time. While our scenarios show a, a wide range of potential outcomes for public transport, with a difference of around 25% between our lowest and highest demand models, this cannot reliably account for changes in population, economy, or indeed technology. So the truth is, nobody can say for sure. 
But we do think that projections of vast shifts to complete home working and the death of big cities are very wide of the mark. Turning to what the network needs to bounce back better, I absolutely agree that COVID should not de deflect us from taking some big decisions about the future of rail and other public transport investment. This is especially so for the North and the Midlands, where key east-west links are poor and where, as the Commission's rail needs assessment has shown, there could be considerable economic benefit in proving key connections between larger towns and cities in the region. Now, of course, as we emerge from the pandemic, such plans need to be sense-checked against the full range of plausible scenarios for long-term demand. But there are plenty of schemes that should proceed, even if one takes a more pessimistic view of future demand for transport. Similarly, when it comes to maintenance of existing services, the logical approach would be for government to continue to support the public transport systems until there is more evidence of future demand patterns. The danger of pulling support too early is that we risk losing parts of the network, beginning a vicious psych, uh, spiral of putting people off the network and back into their cars. The last thing we should be doing. The Commission is also continuing to bang the drum for the importance of additional powers and funding for local leaders to make decisions on the major schemes that they need to help drive economic growth. We still think that somewhere in the region of £30 billion is needed between now and 2040, including locally raised finance and support for the new UK Infrastructure Bank, with a process to identify transformational programmes for key cities, developed in partnership with, respect for, with respective local local authorities. We will see where some of these priorities may lie when we see the government's integrated rail plan, upon which wider regional public transport plans can be made. It's a moment of opportunity. The Commission is looking forward to seeing that plan in the hope of it revealing a strategy that both levels up and builds passenger and industry confidence in the vital role of public transport in our communities. So, wish you all the best with your conference. Thank you. That's great. That was really good to hear from from John there, and um, it, and and that that age question. Currently, you know, we're asking it all the time, aren't we? You know, do we need all of these schemes? Do we need all this? Is it going to look different when we come back? But we need to be realistic. I think you know, most people again know my view on this is that. We don't need, for example, on the railways, if we don't need all the capacity for, for um, passengers, then trust me, there is plenty of need out there for freight capacity on the railways that can take off any slack that might appear in the system. But as you said, it's really so difficult to predict so far ahead. You know, we're building something now in the networks that we're trying to establish that will last decades and decades, and it's impossible to predict that far ahead. And as such, we need to say, well, what does it do for us now? So we know it improves things now. We know it improves head education, communities. It improves um, the economy overall by the investment in, in the infrastructure. So at the end of the day, you know, we should probably, in my opinion, I think it's well known, press on regardless. Right, so we're now going to move to our three key panel members, although hopefully um, David and Tim may be joining us in our panel as well. And we're going to hear from Henry, who is a friend and colleague of mine, who many of you know works absolutely tirelessly to make sure that the businesses in the North and the civic leaders in the North stay in the same page and actually work together to make the best of what we're trying to do with the infrastructure. So, Henry, over to you. Thank you so, so much, Debbie. And it's a pleasure to join you uh, from the great city of Bradford. Uh, so, I'm sitting here in City Hall. Uh, which is a seat of historical power in this great nation of ours, because uh, obviously this was one of the cities that built Britain. And I would like it to play that role in the future. I'd like all our northern cities and towns, uh, as our city regions, to punch above their weight compared to what they do today. And the work that Tim and his colleagues at Transport for North are doing, the analytical work uh, that's been led uh, by their colleagues and, and the Director of Strategy now, I feel has made a compelling case for the connection of this great city and a new city centre station to Leeds and on to Manchester. Um, and so uh, I, although you can't be with me here today in Bradford, it is a pleasure to virtually bring you here and to remind us all that our future could be as great as our past has been. 
Um, and uh, we approach key decisions with the integrated rail plan. Uh, and I will talk uh, predominantly about uh, kind of city to city transport, but don't get me wrong, if we want to get in the panel discussion into, into buses, uh, which I, I do love buses as well, and the opportunities that will come from uh, bus franchising in uh, Greater Manchester, but potentially in other northern city regions as well, what that will do to improve uh, the passenger experience that I think perhaps has been uh, perhaps lacking on some of our bus networks and the accessibility we want for jobs and growth, then I, I'll be delighted to talk about that as well. But in terms of uh, responding really to Sir John Ahmed and to his comments that he has he's kindly made for us this morning, um, I think it's fair to say that I'm, I'm less than positive about the work the NIC have done about the needs for the North and the Midlands. And it's great that Maria will be joining us today and, and very much are in lockstep with my colleagues in the uh, East and West Midlands on these questions. Because the approach the NIC have taken and that Sir John has taken has largely been to look at this from a traditional engineering perspective. And when we undertook with a panel, the Northern Powerhouse in sort of review into HS2, which was published before the Oakaby review, and I think had some influence, I think, on some thinking of some of the members, we took an economic lens to the problem. And we had a number of business people as well as politicians, uh, Nick Forbes, Kevin Hollingrake, uh, Chris Oglesby from Brumwood, uh, and also uh, Sir Howard Bernstein, uh, and a, a respected member of the business community as well in, in West Yorkshire, the former chair of the uh, the Chamber of Commerce there. So that group of individuals gave us a pretty compelling argument uh, working with our advisors about the economic need for improving connectivity, not just between the northern cities, but between the great northern cities and Birmingham and the East Midlands. Um, and the challenge of a kind of a prioritisation of the Western leg at the expense of connectivity on the eastern side of the country is that it ignores the fact that the transport connectivity has always been poor between the cities on the east of this country. And that's why there's lots of challenges around the growth of those places sometimes, and they haven't necessarily achieved their potential. And for a city like Leeds, that is in, uh, I would argue, uh, desperate need of a new railway station uh, and a significant improvement to what is there to meet the needs of the future station, which is filling up anyway. Um, to then start to talk about reducing the capacity to serve that place from the Midlands in particular is a huge missed opportunity. And I look at some of the early wins that HS2 and Northern Powerhouse Rail could deliver. And I make the case, right, that you don't need to divert investment from long-standing programmes because actually we can accelerate the upgrades we already need to do. So the East Coast Main Line, north of here, up the East Coast Main Line, from York to Darlington to Newcastle, that's a project we would need to do anyway, even if we weren't going to do Northern Powerhouse Rail and HS2. So let's get on with it. Let's do it earlier. And let's bring travel benefits to the northeast of England. Let's build that lean side line and genuinely serve communities like the one in Ferry Hill that I think was visited recently uh, by a senior member of the cabinet with the, the local MP there in Sedgefield. Let's build that local infrastructure that has national and northern benefit that has major productivity improvements associated with it, but also improves the lived experience of people in our lifetime, not 20, 30, 40 years away. Uh, and I mean working lifetime, obviously. I'm not, I'm not necessarily expecting to pop my clogs uh, uh, within the, the HS2 delivery programme, though. Uh, obviously, Alan will need to reassure me that, uh, that things are going to keep on track. And I, I think I would really attest to the benefits already to northern businesses of building HS2. There's been huge opportunities for manufacturers on Teesside and the Tees Valley in particular, where we've seen a number of suppliers. Um, and I think what I would say is, when we talk about the need for a British steel industry, the need for us to make things in this country, I'm not just interested in the travel benefits of infrastructure, actually. I'm interested in the economic opportunities of stimulating our core uh, foundational industries, our core industrial base, and doing it in a way that achieves our net zero ambitions. Not importing steel that has a huge kind of embedded carbon element, but making our own steel here in the UK and using it like they do uh, in Scunthorpe for our rails. And I, I pay tribute to our colleagues at Network Rail, soon to obviously be part of, uh, of Great British Railways or whatever it's called, uh, for all they do to support those important industries in the UK to keep jobs in this country making and building things that we need to make our economy work, to make our communities work, and to make this genuinely a greater Britain, because the Northern powerhouse is all about contributing 
more to UK PLC. That's in the national interest, not just the northern interest. And I think those of us in the north and the Midlands have a very clear proposition which stands in opposition, in part to some of the work of the NIC, which is reductionist in taking too much a transport planners approach to infrastructure and not enough of an economic analysis. And the north of England will not be forced to choose between NPR and HS2. We have been promised both by this Prime Minister and we intend to work with the Prime Minister and his Cabinet to deliver both. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Henry. Here, here. And, and, not and, or. That's where we're going. Um, fantastic. Uh, just to remind everybody before I introduce our next panellist that we are going to a panel session shortly, so please um, pop any questions you've got into the into the chat um, for when we get to speaking to our panellists soon. So please now to introduce uh, Maria Mashankosis, who is the Chief Executive of Midlands Connect. Thank you, Maria. Thank you and good morning to everybody. It really is always a pleasure to be invited to a Northern Transport Summit uh, and uh, to make sure that the North acknowledges, um, and we certainly do, the important relations between the Midlands and the North, and particularly in the debate as crucial as today in terms of decisions of government and how we support the levelling up agenda and the Midlands and, and, and the North. So really pleased to be here today. I got a little video uh, to show you uh, all, and it's not to uh, create a competition between the Midlands and the North on priorities, um, uh, but I'll let you just explore that first. Uh, so if I could ask the organizers to play the video first, please. Midlands Connect has been investigating an opportunity that would better connect London, Birmingham, Telford, Shrewsbury and Wales, creating jobs, helping to level up the economy and helping the nation to achieve its zero carbon targets. The scheme would provide faster and more frequent train services between Shrewsbury, Telford and the West Midlands and all day services to London. We've been told for many years that electrification of the line is a pipe dream. It's not possible to achieve. It's unrealistic and it's too expensive. Well, we're not prepared to accept uh, those doomsayers saying that we're not uh, going to be able to su uh, succeed in getting this investment. A better train service is going to give people in Penderford and across the black country better connections to opportunities. And I think that's what's crucial. So people in Penderford could get a really quick train down to London, into Birmingham, out to Shrewsbury with job opportunities, training opportunities and I think that's really exciting. Transport actually represents everything about people. Housing, employment, education. One of the things that I want for Sandwell is to make sure that we are never left behind. Our people, all of us, yeah, have the choice and flexibility to do what we have to do and to go where we have to go safely. Now our next logical step is to campaign for the electrification of the line between Shrewsbury and Wolverhampton, which will not only reduce CO2 emissions substantially, uh, but also ensure additional investment into our community and beyond, or some put it as high as £500 million in conjunction uh, with the HS2 investment. At the moment, it feels like levelling up is a bit of a bit of a phrase, a bit of a catchphrase for all investment that comes into the Midlands. But as I said, for decades we've had underinvestment into our infrastructure, into our power, into our roads, and into our trains. So levelling up means to us major investment to get the Midlands moving again, to get our industry moving again, so that people can get in and out of the cities, in and out of the workplaces, and our businesses can grow, so we can get our products all around the world. The Midlands has massive potential. But in order to realise that potential, we have to invest in the schemes and the connectivity that are needed to unlock that potential. We believe that schemes like this will um, create jobs, they will help to, to level up the economy, and they will uh, create a brighter future for people who live and work in the Midlands. Thank you. So um, I think from hopefully what you have uh, seen there is that the appetite for levelling up and for supporting our communities is equal here in the Midlands that there is in the North. So I was not particularly choosing any particular programme, like, with, like Transport for the North, Midlands Connect, 
were uh, given a clear mandate from government to prioritize what was you know important for a region in terms of a railway investment um, and as you could see that's that's a, actually an investment proposal between the black country and Shropshire uh, for those who know the Midlands beautiful part of the world that's exactly where I live um, but it does always refers to HS2 in some way or so we really understand the links to HS2 we know how to maximize Israel's capacity we know how to actually then locally uh, present proposals for enhanced local connectivity too so railways are hugely important when it comes to um, decisions about leveling up uh, I think, uh, like Henry and, uh, and many others, hopefully today you will hear is the Midlands remains totally united that um, we need the connectivity that we deserve uh, in terms of HS2. We need to have HS2 delivered in full. And that means not on the way to Manchester, but actually the one area that we're particularly concerned is the Eastern leg. And of course, following the COVID pandemic, uh, there are unparalleled pressure on public finances. And we know that the economy, you know, there's lots of pressures on government in making the right decisions. But those decisions need to be considered, um, you know, and be pragmatic, but they're not, they cannot leave uh, 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 an investment proposal for the Midlands and the North that does not help us in the way we all were hoping HS2 will do as a clear catalyst for growth. Um, so it was not just about connectivity, it was not just about a track, it was actually about regenerating, recommunicating, um, reinvigorating um, many, many towns and cities in the Midlands and the North that were left behind for decades. So we've been in this debate for 12 years. Um, we, we know exactly how we want to connect to the North. We are really excited about it and we want also uh, HS2 to, to do what it does best, uh, to act as a catalyst for economic and social regeneration. So when it comes to the integrated rail plan, we really do hope that government considers not just the short-term economic challenge, but the long-term opportunity. And in fact, what we don't want, we definitely don't want, is the delivery of HS2 in a manner that ultimately creates a division, not the North-South division, maybe enhances it even more, but actually an East-West division too. So we want a HS2 network that is fit for the future, that it brings totally brings the, the South, the Midlands, the North, and indeed Scotland together. And this is, um, you know, of course there'll be short-term challenges, but we need to stick to the overall plan. And uh, we are working very hard to make sure that, uh, you know, with colleagues in the North, to make sure that in that final decision, uh, those, um, those very important issues are well understood in government, not only from a transport perspective, but from an economic perspective too. I hope that's helpful as a kickoff, anyway, Debbie. Thank you, Maria. Okay, and then finally, um, for our panel, it's uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce Alan Cook, uh, the chairman of HS2. Hopefully, he's still with us. Yes, Alan, over to you. I am still here, Debbie. Thank you very much, um, and uh, I'm really, really, uh, obviously pleased uh, to be speaking to you. Um, this morning, but I'm uh, even more pleased to share a panel with uh, Henry and Maria and delighted to hear Maria mention the fact that it's not only about connecting uh, the Midlands and the North, it's actually about connecting up to Scotland because I'm speaking to you rather from Henry uh, in Bradford, I'm speaking to you from Fife in Scotland. Um, let me just start off by talking about, um, I think, overall the last 15 months has probably taught us one thing, and that is that uh, we can't always foresee from one year to the next um, what the immediate imperative will be or is going to be. So with the, uh, the onset of the pandemic, it was difficult for many um, uh, in various sectors, but particularly in the transport industry, where we saw um, the absolute collapse of uh, passenger floors and the transport systems really and the companies associated with them trying to adjust to what was a very immediate uh, reality. Now, since, of course, we believe that um, I really sincerely hope that we have 
um, addressed some of the issues with regard to the pandemic. Uh, vaccine programs going remarkably well uh, um, from a, a government point of view and from, a, from our point of view. Um, there are still many people who are saying that, well, what this will mean is that it's going to be a massive a negative upheaval in the way that people um, live uh, and operate in the future. Uh, in other words, more local um, involvement uh, and less travel. I don't um, subscribe to that. Um, the, undoubtedly, the pandemic has accelerated trends. Um, certainly, um, when we look in HS2 and what we're asking our people to do and listening very carefully to what they're telling us, um, they are saying that um, digital work is indeed a reality. But um, since the lockdown and the restrictions uh, eased off from Scotland and Nicola allowed me to travel out of Scotland, um, I've been into Birmingham um, a couple of times, London a couple of times over the last um, three weeks. And the first week, um, travelling down by train from Edinburgh, um, I was the in standard class, by the way, um, because we were thinking about government money, um, but I was, I was the only person in that carriage the first time I travelled down to Birmingham, the only person in my carriage. Yesterday, I travelled back from Birmingham um, from New Street into Edinburgh, and the carriage was not full. I would, uh, that's, that would be wrong, um, but it certainly was um, significantly more people in there. Gradually, over time, the situation and the travel position will change. And the reason that it will change is because fundamentally, uh, mobility is a part of the human condition. We are definitely a social species. I mean, the, it's great that we can do this uh, with connectivity, with better broadband. We can have video conferences and we can quite efficiently and effectively uh, improve our productivity and actually um, do it quite well. But there isn't anything that beats the social interaction. I can't tell you how much pleasure I had being in London, uh, our London offices, and in Birmingham and on the sites to meet up with people that I hadn't seen, hadn't seen face to face for um, a number of months, sometimes over a year. There is an absolute need for us to be socially interactive, um, and of course, therefore, what we're dealing with. In, is the immediate impact of the pandemic, of course. But we've got to keep a focus on the horizon and what the future is going to look like. We've got to, in HS2, build, operate and maintain the rail system that serves towns, cities, communities, regions and nations, not only today, not only in the next decade, but for generations. And that means, as John, as Sir John Ahmed said, that we have to back better transport. We've got to match the policies that, we, that Sir John talked about with the many challenges that we face and focus on the things that are absolute imperatives for um, transportation. Sustainable economic growth, making the system that we operate in reliable and safe, and integrating between various modes so that we can provide a seamless point-to-point -point travel. And sometimes we miss out on some of the points about, okay, it's, it's imperative that it is reliable and safe, but it's also got to be a pleasurable experience. Because when you look at the transportation, the rail transportation, what you find is that on um, when we did a study of long-term passenger activity on the West Coast Main Line, that what it's reasonable even split between uh, across the week between people who were saying they were using the train for business uh, or for leisure and um, visiting friends and family, but in that's in the middle of the week, that's about two thirds of the journey were for business, but at weekends. Four in five of the passengers, so 80% of the passengers, were actually travelling 
for leisure, you know, sporting events, um, social events, meeting up with family, going to a gig, all of these sort of things. And we have to make that experience pleasurable. So the opportunities for longer distance travel are not just for people in suits. The policy the challenge that we've got is not just to boost business, but to provide greater opportunities through our transport system for people to fulfill their potential. There is no doubt that in the southeast of England, they have and have had many op uh, opportunities to develop that talent, that skill, that innovation. But actually, in the Midlands and the North, and indeed in Scotland um, and Wales and Northern Ireland, we have amazing pockets of expertise, of skills, uh, of innovation that need to be put together so that we can basically improve the, the whole economic situation within the UK. And that, in terms of connectivity, is absolutely essential. So where, and this is really, in my mind, and I think in HS2's mind, where rail travel holds a distinct advantage over other transport modes. It's where a rail network fully integrated with HS2, Northern Powerhouse Rail, the Midlands Engine Rail, we have a strategic role to play in building back better and levelling up. I see no, absolutely no future in which the demand for mobility, for uh, economic growth and for progress that is radically diminished. We have to be in HS2 and in the real transport uh, organisations, pioneers for that future. It isn't about today, or sorry, it isn't only about today. It isn't only about the next decade. It is about the next generation. And that's what we have to build for. We have made over the last three years in HS2 massive progress. We've come through several reviews um, several a number of people questioning, continually questioning um, the validity of HS2. Um, but we are making massive progress. On phase one, the, the uh, tunnel balling machines um, started uh, just over a week ago. Three years, they will be operating uh, and building tunnels. A massive improvement. Um, the announcement on Curzon Street, the fact that we are now employing over 16,000 people 500 apprentices. We just aligned, uh, as one of our joint venture, um, announced nine tunneling apprenticeships just this week. An innovative engineering of new piling techniques. All of these sort of things will help us to develop the capability that we need. Uh, and I'm sorry, I really, uh, I've, Debbie, I've probably extended my, my time, um, but having the opportunity to share a platform with Maria and Henry and to explain just exactly why I think that HS2, as a part of an integrated rail system, is really, really important, is too good an opportunity to miss. Um, so um, thank you very much for listening to me, um, and I look forward to participating in the panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alan. Um, and for anybody who may have realised that Alan obviously is on the phone, he's got a few connectivity issues, but he's there and we can hear us and we all heard you great there, Alan, so thank you very much. Okay, so yeah, we are a little bit behind, but we are going to get to a couple of questions anyway. Um, so uh, I'm going to put a, one or two questions to the panel as a whole. Um, you can just put your hand up who'd like to go first on the answers, and then we do have them coming in through the chat, um, and I'd like to maybe see if anyone can get an answer to that. So really the key one I'd like to, to ask this panel with this panel being you know specifically looking at the build back better question is can we actually build back better how do we ensure that we don't just do the same again and make the same kind of mistakes and and, and as a consequence cause the same sorts of issues and and you know the publicity that goes around those issues and um, as we go forward can we actually do it um and I'm happy to, I mean, I'll start that with Henry, I think, just so that we get the ball rolling, because I know he'll be desperate to answer that one. So, Henry. 
I think it's a good. I think it's a good question, Debbie. And I would. I would draw it. I would kind of. I would answer it by trying to kind of break down the idea that there's a difference between what we need to do to get the economy moving again now, and what we need to do for the long term. Because I think I'm maybe I'm old-fashioned, but I would rather say to the Treasury, why don't you give us some money now to do the things we needed to do anyway? And we'll just do them a bit faster <laughs> uh, and spend a bit more of the money now and a bit less later. I mean, I, I mean that sounds uh, kind of a bit like, and I think there's a kind of bit of fuzzy logic right around some of this stuff, right? So uh, when you look at the calculations around the kind of long-term plans for Northern England, uh, it's all premised the fact we can't afford as much of HS2 as we need because we're going to build Crossrail 2. Well, ask anyone in London, they're not planning to build Crossrail 2 in the the planning period where the NIC did their infrastructure assessment. So I'm afraid to John and his colleagues are really uh, doing a disservice right to the actual realities of this, which is that we are going to level up the country, uh, and that means that many parts of the North and Midlands that have been underinvested in are going to see more infrastructure investment. That shouldn't be at the expense of London, but where London anyway isn't ready because it doesn't have a local contribution that it would need for Crossrail 2 to pr proceed, we should spend the money the way we were going to wait for them, right? So in the original national infrastructure assessment, TFN got the money that was left over at the end of the spending period for NPR. And that's how the NIC decided what money to give the north of England. It's now time to do that a different way around. I think that other parts of the country will have to wait, right, uh, for us to finish what we need to do. Because if we're going to pay the taxes that are going to pay back the costs of this crisis, we need decent connectivity to attract investment and to create the the higher productivity economy that we need. And, and I think that some of those important rail schemes that I think that people like Rob McIntosh, his colleagues on the east of the country are standing ready to deliver, um, mirroring some of the great work that's been done on the past on the, on the West Coast mainline, for instance, some great projects that were delivered many years ago now, but the equivalent hasn't been done right on the eastern side of the north. And particularly what I really value about that, that report that was done the, the Shaps Williams Review, I know we're now supposed to call it, it isn't just the Williams Review anymore. Uh, and your earlier challenge, right, Debbie, is that there are many benefits around ticketing, around improving existing services, around improving connectivity within city regions by having a big role, metro mayors deciding the future of how services are provided, very much like the way Steve Rotherham uh, uses Mersey Rail as an economic tool, not just as a transport network in his, his local city region producing more of that work across the north. Those things will all deliver much quicker benefits than just the infrastructure alone. Um, and we need to really see that opportunity to do the long-term things, but to get the short-term jobs from them, but also to think about how can we use the existing asset, the existing subsidy that we still have in the northern franchise, and better deploy that to meet our economic aspirations and, and see a role for city regions driving up patronage, right? Because those integrated ticketing systems, the integration of the improved bus network in Greater Manchester with rail and tram, that will put people on the network, that will produce more income in the fare box, and that is how we can pay for better services in the north, to drive up patronage through integration, better ticketing. And that's why we absolutely still need the Noyster, the northern Oyster. We can't allow uh, the, the changes that are happening in the fare system to just be about smart ticketing, which you've already got on Northern and Transpennine bluntly anyway. It's got to be about simpler fares so people can jump, jump on a train in Blythe, get off at Media City, and they'll know how much it'll cost. And it will reliably always be cheaper than booking ahead uh, if, they, if they do it tap in, tap out. And it will always reliably be cheaper than the car. And at the moment, many Northerners who are travelling across the Pennines do not think that it is easy or simple or actually necessarily cheaper to go by train. We need to prove to them that it is, and that's how we'll drive up patronage and sort those sort of short-term problems, which we know we'll see in the rail industry, around the, the cost of services versus the fare box. If we can get more people who didn't use rail before, more people who didn't use bus before, through franchising and better approaches, uh, sorry, through the, the kind of the way we procure those services, that is about driving up patronage. Hey, thanks. Thank you for that, Henry. Um, before we go on to the next question, we don't have a lot of time, but very quickly, Alan, would you like to add into that conversation? Um, you know, how do we actually build back better and not just do the same again? I mean, well, I, I think, actually, Debbie, in, in, um, I think Henry is right on the money. Um, I think that, um, I, I think the, from an HS2 point of view, we are doing exactly that. We are building back better um, because we are providing those, those essential links and connectivity in a sustainable way that is going to deliver the connectivity, the capacity, and the low carbon uh, 
and position necessary um, for the government to achieve not only Build Back Better, not only the levelling up, but actually to achieve the targets of um, zero uh, carbon emissions by uh, by 2050. And if we're going to do that, transport, uh, the transport sector is now the largest emitter of carbon emissions um, in, uh, in, in any sector. Uh, it's overtaken energy now. Um, and uh, so we have to find better ways of uh, being able to not only um, build, but build back better. And the only the way that we can do that is to provide a meaningful capacity system with the right connectivity across our cities and our regions and our towns to provide that. And the rail system and the integrated rail system is the only transport the mode of transport that can actually do that. It, you know, we, we need to get more cars and freight off the roads. Uh, we need to reduce air travel between our inner cities. Uh, and in order for us to do that, we have to have a safe, reliable, and enjoyable transport and rail system. And Sorry, transport system. And rail is the only the only mode of transport that actually does that. And HS2 is an integral part of that. Um, and so I, I think that it is such an important asset for the Build Back Better campaign and the levelling up agenda and the environmental imperative that we have. Climate change is probably one of the biggest challenges, if not the biggest challenge, we face within the UK internationally, globally. Um, so having a cleaner um, system is actually the way forward for the next generation. And that's why I think it's important. And that's why I think that we're actually delivering on what the Prime Minister and what the government want us to deliver on. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you for that, Alan. Uh, Maria, I'm going to come to you just to, to see what your opinion is. Very slightly on that same topic, you know, build back better. So Henry and, and Alan have talked very articulately about obviously, you know, building back that infrastructure better to get the better connectivity to improve those communities to help make, you know, help us as a country to reach our carbon ambitions, etc. But there are other elements that people may see as building back better, and that's building back with speed, building back without the delay, building back without the um, accelerated costs, you know, the, the, the ever-increasing cost and things. Do you think that we're actually in a position to be able to do that as well? Totally agree. I was just going to come out with my, my, my agile pace is key to all of this. Um, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, 12 years we've been talking uh, about HS2 uh, and, uh, and we're very, very pleased, at least in the Midlands, we start to see, as Alan said, some of the benefits uh, um, and even if HS2 is not even arriving into these Midlands for a few years, we're already experiencing that. But it's all about planning with certainty, with focus, with determination and, and agile you know, and pace around our planning and delivery of infrastructure. It's going to be crucial moving forward. We cannot keep talking about it. We need to just really go for it. Um, and, and that's extremely important for our businesses, our communities, but also internationally speaking, it gives a signal of this is a place to invest. This is a place that is determined to meet that uh, climate change agenda and actually um, uh, invest in, in, in sustainable transport, which is extremely important. The other element that we look at when we think about Build Back Better uh, is also integration. You know, we need to make sure that this is not projects coming uh, back and forward in, a, in an independent manner. We need to link it up multimodally as we talk, but also locally versus national versus international. You know, how it links with our airports, how it links with our ports. This is all part of Build Back Better. That's extremely important for the Midlands. There's also an element of innovation too. Uh, Wendy, you know, um, we uh, we seen again how through through the technology has accelerated phenomenally, and I'm sure Alan could give you massive examples of how HS2 is already through the enabling works pioneering fantastic methods of construction, remotely planning, but then deliver it on site in, in, in a fraction of time compared to what it will have happened, like they did phenomenally well on the M42 in Solihull. Um, so fantastic opportunity for our businesses, for our uh, private sector, for our SMEs 
to accelerate and apply innovation in construction. So this definitely is a massive bit of the Build Back Better. And that links to my final eye, which is about internationalization. You know, we need to showcase all these Build Back Better agenda to the world. We need to show the world that when it comes to delivering planning infrastructure, we are the best you could get. And uh, HS2 definitely presents a huge opportunity to do that. Um, so um, I hope that helps in terms of the wider context of Build Back Better from a Midlands perspective. Thank you so much for that. Um, okay, so we, we really don't have time. I've got one question that has come in though through the chat. I don't think if it's fair that we ask everybody to put chat questions in and then we don't get to ask it. So uh, apologies that we can't hear more from the panel, but I have one final question. It's coming from John Tilly. Um, I think it's a tricky one to answer. So I'm not quite sure whether you're going to get satisfaction in that answer today or not, John. But John has asked, uh, the actual reality of MW Scott's connectivity is that we're losing TP services north of Newcastle, Sledenburg in December. And Liverpool's Newcastle services are going to be down one to one per hour. Um, and then that's a question I'm going to ask Tim to see if you can, if you can um, give John some satisfaction in that. Thank you very much for that, Debbie, <clears throat> and hi, John. Um, so what the department currently looking at at the moment is uh, to increase the uh, LNER services, so building on the benefit uh, of the work that's been done at King's Cross uh, right the way up the northeast uh, uh, coast and, of course, on up to Scotland. Uh, what we're doing is working uh, very collaboratively with the departments at the moment, looking at some of those TPE services uh, and saying uh, we think there's further pathing opportunities uh, to get some of those services across to Middlesbrough, over to Saltburn, uh, to get back connectivity that has actually been lost there. I mean, ultimately, uh, the key bit here is we just haven't got enough capacity. North of North Allerton, we dropped from four tracks down to two tracks. Uh, that's why we talked about reopening Leamside uh, as part of the part of the MPR programme. But ultimately, Everybody is talking about the real positiveness of rail and rail travel and driving the economy because they are economic projects, these schemes. What's the key thing to unlock these? It's offering value for money. And a bit about the value for money is that's where it comes through the industry, through the people that design and build these railways to get them in early, talking about the issues with the client. It's always been the client's always right. Well, actually, it's different. The client's not necessarily always right because the industry has that experience out there in the cold building a railway. And we very much have welcomed that. And we've seen the costs of NPR go from 80 billion down to 40. A BCR go from 0.1 to over one now. And for us, uh, we're building over and above that, adding all the land value capture uh, uh, value. So of course, pushing that BCR harder. We think there's far more to get off that scheme, still remaining fully transformational, and it's really working hard with all our partners in the rail industry, including HS2 Limited, uh, Network Rail, and the department. Drive those costs down, but get continuity for the industry. We can build back better a lot quicker then. Thanks, Debbie. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Um, I'm going to say thank you to all the panellists. I know that that felt really short, and we could probably talk so much more on things, but we, we've got to try and find our way to catch up with the rest of the day now. Um, clearly, I need to practice on my chairman skills. Um, great. Thank you. It's been fantastic to hear from you all. So for everybody listening in, um, it isn't going to be a 10-minute break. I think we're just going to try and take a literally a two-minute comfort break. I hope that's okay. We'll try and catch up and get to having um, the, the better break after the next session. So thank you all. I'll see you back in two minutes.
Hello? Xavier, can you hear me? Okay. Welcome back to the session, everybody. Um, I hope we can you can all hear me fine. Um, we've just had a really interesting first session this morning. Um, many of you will have been on it, so you'll know. For those that may have only just joined us, our session this morning was looking at building back transport for the North. Um, and we heard from some, from, from some great key speakers and some panelists. Um, and now we're into our second session for the morning. So um, this session is about connecting people and places. Um, and, and thinking about what the North needs to reset and to level up. So we're going to start um, with a short video from Jim McMahon MP, Shadow Secretary of State for, the, for Transport. Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me to speak to the Northern Powerhouse. This is a critical time for our regional economies as we come out of the pandemic and we look ahead as we see the nature of investment that we need to realise our full potential. It's critical that we make the case to government and it's critical that we demand absolute parity with the investment that the capital has seen over generations. You know, like I do, that the UK is one of the most economically unequal in the whole of Europe. And because of that, many of our regions haven't seen the investment that they need. We haven't seen a commitment to our foundation economies and our industries. Uh, and we haven't seen the investment in that critical infrastructure that would allow us to kickstart that revolution. And it's right now, coming out of the pandemic, when we need that economic boost, that the government really step up to the plate. But it's also the case, even before COVID arrived on our shores, that 10 years of austerity has done damage to the quality of our economy, the quality of our jobs, and the quality of life for people who we live amongst. And it's not right, it's got to be put right by the government. So just think now that there's a 15 billion pound funding black hole for local councils. There's a 10 billion pound funding black hole just to repair the potholes in the road. The government have only provided 1% of that. Had the North of England had the same investment as a capital, we would be 66 billion pound better off. We would be thriving because of that investment not being held back in the way that we have seen. And frankly, the genie is now out of the bottle. And as much as uh, the government might want to put our Metro mayor back in their box, uh, I'm afraid that just won't happen. You know, we've seen a huge groundswell of support in the most recent election for our Metro mayors who were in power, sticking up for their areas and making the case for being dealt with with respect, but also actually setting the bar uh, for what good can be whether that's about investment in public services or future investment in our economy. And of course, the very real support that our businesses and our economy needed 
to support us through that very difficult time. As we come through the pandemic, of course, how we live and how we work may well change and not go back to the way it was. And so the demand of government has got to be to be flexible, but also to understand that it may well take very, you know, quite a long time for that to resettle. And so it's important that the government take a medium to long term view about the nature of ongoing support that's going to be needed, whether that's about aviation and the, in, the impact that the, uh, the restrictions have had on incoming uh, passengers and the uh, red, green and amber list, whether it's about railways and how we transition from our current franchise system through the emergency management uh, agreement to essentially uh, the new uh, Williams Shaps review and those passenger service contracts. That will take time to settle even before we see the impact of those flexible fares uh, and what that might mean. And as much as we kind of focus on the big projects, and of course I'm a huge advocate for HS2, absolutely 100% behind Northern Powerhouse Rail, demanding that government stop announcing and re-announcing and actually start investing in a way that is meaningful. We also need to understand that revenue is as important as capital. So if we want our bus services to be as affordable as London, that's going to require a turbocharger of revenue investment to bring those ticket prices into line to increase patronage so it begins to stand on its own two feet in a way that's viable over the medium term. If we want to realise uh, jobs uh, and a thriving economy, of course, capital is important for that, but so too is revenue. You know, you've got to invest in early years, uh, education and skills for that ha to happen as well. And I think the government have got now a once in a lifetime opportunity. Coming out of COVID, it can't go back to the way it was. It can't be business as usual. And frankly, our patience for repeat announcements has completely worn out. So the government do need to come to the table. They need to give away not just investment, but also political power as well, and make sure that our metro mayors, our council leaders, our combined authorities have the wherewithal to make the decisions that they know is right for their area, where metro mayors and combined authorities across the whole of the north of England can work together with more power and devolve resources. I think when we see that, we'll begin to realise our full potential. Great to hear from um, Jim McMahon there and really stay 66 billion better off if we'd had kind of Paris of investment. That's no small figure. Um, and I totally agree. And uh, many of us probably will. But, um, we've heard the words, we've heard the claims that the investments will start, uh, that the intention is there by government. And um, I suppose what you could say really is that we need to see the money now. So um, that was that was really great. So on now, please, I'd like to introduce um, Baron S. Beer, uh, Minister for Department of Transport, who's going to going to speak to us next. Thanks very much, and thank you very much to Diva Connect and to Transport for the North and for Transport Focus for inviting me to speak today. Um, it is my pleasure to actually uh, be able to be with you and to answer some questions afterwards if we if we have any time. Um, and certainly, you know, what a difference five months can make, because I know that back in December, my colleague Andrew Stevenson addressed probably many of you at the Transport for the North conference. And if you think back to December, Wow, is it tough. We were in the throes of a very long and difficult winter. And I'm sure that, uh, like you, um, things were, were looking pretty grim. Um, but I think now everything is certainly much more positive. Uh, we're at the sort of right stage in a very success successful vaccine rollout. Um, and we've got over a third of the population fully vaccinated so far. Um, all being well, we will be able to lift restrictions further um, as we reach step four in the roadmap, which, of course, will have huge uh, beneficial impacts on the economy. And as we rebuild, we need to look no further than the north of England as an aspiration and an inspiration as to what building back better means. It means more decisions that affect people's lives being taken locally by elected representatives. It means positioning the UK as a leader in green technology, helping to reach our net zero targets by 2050. And it means continuing to invest to connect our towns and our cities, which all in all means accountability, sustainability and investment. Now, I think that is a recipe that already works wonders in the north and can be a nationwide blueprint for greener, stronger and a more inclusive economic recovery. But whilst the future is looking brighter by the day, I think, there has been no escaping the bleakness of the last 12 months. Um, livelihoods 
and lives have been have been turned upside down uh, across the country. All sectors of the economy have been impacted, especially transport. Um, and so in order to keep our services running for essential workers, we did rightly step in with financial support. Um, that included over £12 billion for the rail network, um, over a billion pounds for local bus services, and nearly £200 million for like rail systems. And we completely understand that that is not job done. We've got to build a transport system fit for the future. And in the north, that means we're spending billions to unlock potential, to move people faster, easier, at a lower cost, um, to reverse the decades of underinvestment that uh, uh, you have noted um, chair and also that Jim McMahon noted and I would also note that of course it is decades it is not just uh, in the last few years uh, we do need to uh, put that right and we intend to do so so turning to the workhorse uh, of our economy um, buses the national bus strategy it's the biggest shake-up to buses in a generation We'll be investing £3 billion over the course of this parliament to deliver more modern and accessible buses at greater frequency and reliability. There will be more bus priority schemes to make sure that buses can glide past congested traffic. Um, and together with more turn up and go services across all urban routes, we will get people out of polluting cars onto the buses and 4,000 of those are going to be new zero emission vehicles, which is very exciting. And uh, I think the other thing we need to tackle, um, and I know my Secretary of State is very keen on this as well, is uh, ticketing. The days of complex ticketing, they must come to an end, whether it's on buses or on rail. Because, you know, particularly on buses, uh, you have operators that don't recognise each other's tickets. Uh, you have, you know, sometimes you, you aren't able to buy uh, a capped fare at all. All of these things we've got to sort out, and so we need to replace it the simpler, uh, cheaper fares, which are integrated across rail, tram and bus. And I know this is not easy. This is quite an undertaking, but we've absolutely got to crack this nut because I think in terms of bringing back confidence to public transport is really essential. Also on buses, I think we need to think about rural areas. It is not just about our urban centres. We often focus on our urban centres, but we've got to think about areas where the population density is lower. So we've um, invested £20 million pounds of funding for demand responsive transport to see how that works in rural areas and whether it can be rolled out um, uh, across many other areas. Because once people get used to it, they've got a smartphone, they can request a service from their smartphone, it will pick them up nearer their home and take them to where they want to be. It's not like a normal bus. And of course, people are, like, are very used to normal buses. So we need to really think about how we can market that and show people that actually the, this sort of demand responsive transport, it absolutely is for them. And they should be tapping on their phone and getting on their local service. So at the heart of our bus strategy, we want to deliver well-connected, reliable and affordable bus services. And actually the delivery and indeed the planning of those will be in the hands of local transport authorities working with operators because I absolutely believe that resp the responsibility and accountability must rest locally. We cannot plan services from Westminster. That would be nuts. And so what we are, uh, are asking local transport authorities to do is to put plans in place for their networks. And I know you will have heard about the changes to the rail network. Again, more transformative change in transport. Um, so yes, this is a very significant uh, shift creating this public body, Great British Railways, which will bring together track and train. It'll own the infrastructure, collect the fare revenue, run and plan the network and set the uh, timetable and most fares. So it will be a single guiding mind, which, of course, will be so important. Um, and it will also be, have um, a regional, be made up of uh, various regional uh, uh, operations as well to make sure that it, it takes into account sort of the more, more regional and local needs. So this will end the fragmentation and lack of accountability that frankly has impacted serve, um, passengers so, so badly uh, for so long. We've got passenger service contracts which will replace the existing franchise arrangements and we will put in place stronger incentives on the operators to deliver high quality punctual services to manage their costs and to attract more passengers. And these changes will be supported by 17 billion pounds of investment across the network over the next three, year, three years. And of course, this includes uh, 
hundreds of millions of pounds for the Transpennine route upgrade, which is, I think, is the largest single investment in uh, existing track in the country. Um, and that upgrade will be obviously running between uh, Manchester and Leeds, restoring passenger services on the Northumberland line for the first time since uh, 6064. And that's just part of the 500 million pounds uh, that we put aside to reopen lines lost following uh, the beaching cuts in the 1960s. And of course, we are one step closer to bringing high speed rail to the north. So we've got Royal Ascent for phase 2A. Uh, and now we need to ensure that more direct services to other cities, such as Liverpool, Warrington, Preston, uh, um, uh, are available as the HS2 trains join the existing rail network. And of course, I'm sure everybody is waiting with bated breath for the integrated rail plan and it will be published soon i know you've heard that before it will be it will be and we will set out how high speed rail will will fit into um other northern uh, rail projects northern Pahas rail and, and all of the other projects because we really do want to deliver increased connectivity for passengers more quickly um very very briefly finally i mean you know on roads and trams we've done all sorts of things um over recent months, the 42 new air-conditioned trains will grace a modernised Nexus Metro in Tyne of Weir, which is fantastic. Um, and of course, on the strategic roads, um, which as Roads Minister is an area close to my heart, we are doing uh, lots of investment in the north from the ACC6, the ACC3, St. Mr. Island, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And all of this is, is what it for. It's about levelling up. It is absolutely critical that we ensure that our transport system can level up. And it's not just about the cities. I know we love to talk about the cities. The cities are great. I'm really worried about the towns as well. And I think that getting them to, to be able to level up is really important. And that's why I think the Leveling Up Fund um, will go part of the way to enabling uh, uh, the towns in particular to focus on what really matters to them. And I hope that they all pick transport projects, but of course, it may be that this year they don't and that they pick something else. Um, but we will have to see. But I think the opportunity is there for us to be able to, to um, level up towns, um, obviously, as well as the big cities um, and, the, and the mayoral combined authorities across the north will, of course, be benefiting from the intercity inter transport settlements, which we will be uh, negotiating, I think, fairly soon. So I'm looking forward to working with the mail combined authorities. Or is very disappointed to hear Jim McMahon saying that we, we, we government probably wishes we didn't have them. Well, I don't know. This part of government certainly doesn't agree with Jim McMahon on that or, or on many other things. Because I really appreciate the work that we get done, uh, that, that I am able to do working with the Metro mayors. I always appreciate their, their insight and their requests. I try and meet as many as I can. And I know that, you know, we have a good relationship. And I, I very much hope um, that that continue, can continue. So we also know that technology is going to play a key role. Uh, we know that the North is already really uh, uh, at the cutting edge in terms of uh, hydrogen production. Unfortunately, not all of it is green hydrogen, uh, but I'm sure there'll be more in the future, particularly as the um, uh, we get some stuff out of the first um, hydrogen transport hub, which is in the Tees Valley, as everyone will know. And of course, lots of other R&D going on um, across the North. So I could go on. But I'm probably not going to, because I'm fairly sure there'll be some questions. So for all the misery that the pandemic has brought, there is now a big opportunity to rebuild in a way that's, that's fit for the future. And I look forward to working uh, with Metro Mayors and indeed representatives across the north um, to make sure that we bring investment as quickly as we can to connect people better and to boost the economy. Thank you. Thank you um, so much for that. If you've got time just for a couple of very quick questions, um, that would be great. Right. Yeah, so I'm sure our panellists who are waiting to come on next are very pleased to hear you say that you're not uh, against the, the Metro Mayors because they're, they're stacked up waiting to come on for the next panel. So that's, that's very good to hear. Um, and I know you mentioned the IRP and I know that you said, you know, it is coming very soon. But And I've got to push you on this. You know, are we going to get the IRP before the House rises in July um, or are we going to have to wait till it comes back after, after, after September? I... It's coming shortly. I can't, you know, I, I, I would hope it comes before the House rises in July. I'm yeah, give a hundred percent guarantee. Would, would, yeah. I know, I, I know, but you know what? I think the, the, the really, the most important thing is that we get it right. 
Um, and I know that a huge amount of work is still going on looking at representations from shareholders, you know, looking at the Realm Needs Assessment uh, document further, and also just, you know, just t taking evidence from all sorts of different, different um, uh, stakeholders that we need to. We've got to get it right. And it's not like we've got it sitting in the cupboard gathering dust. Work continues. So it, it, it rather like the bus strategy, you know, everyone wanted to see it. Yeah, we all wanted to see it. I wanted to get out the door, but it wasn't ready yet. That's the most important thing, to get it out uh, in, in the best form possible. And then, so then another question, I suppose, you know, in order to really, to really make this work and to deliver on all of these great ambitions, do you therefore see that there is a need to potentially have some more devolved powers into our, into our metro minutes and into our authorities um, going forward in order to try and make sure that this gets, gets delivered correctly? What would be your view of it? I mean, I think we should always look at the the, um, the balance of power between central government and devolved mayors. And of course, um, for some of them, uh, they don't have as many transport powers as, as others, which makes it really difficult as a transport minister because you're dealing with different people who can do different things, which is a little bit irritating. So quite why that happens is slightly beyond me. And, um, you know, certainly uh, a bit of levelling up of transport powers would be a good thing. But there's one thing that I... I um, I've been focusing a lot on recently or thinking about a lot where I really, I think, need some insight and help from the Metro Mayors. And that is how do we maximise, and we absolutely have to do, we absolutely have to maximise investment into transport with regeneration in the local area. Because I'm concerned that, you know, we've got these great big mega projects coming in, and I know that could be for rail, that can be um, for road. And it's almost that, how do we then make sure that we are able to package land, that we can uh, do that regeneration, and that the two work hand in hand. So providing local transport systems, ensuring that housing and uh, in, uh, employment areas are all sort of in place, sort of ready for when the, the, the big major infrastructure comes in. I mean, I did do a bit of work around looking at what happened to HS1 and when that was built and whether or not we really benefited in Ebsby and Ashford from the, from, the, from the development that we should have seen. And I think there's lessons to be learned there. And so I'm certainly, that one of the things that I really want to focus on is making sure that how do we get all of the bits of national and local government working together so that, you know, and, and we build the right sort of uh, uh, collaborative framework so that these things get done. There's a, too much silos going on at the moment. So we've got to pull together MHCLG, DFT, the Metro Mayors, Local transport authorities, depending on you know where you are, but it's all got to work as one. Otherwise, we will be spending billions of pounds, and we won't be getting the most of it. And I think that would be wrong. Okay. Okay. Well, we do. We are, as you know, we started behind time, so we're we're trying to catch up now. It was really, really great to hear from you. And thank you so much. And um, I'd be interested when I get into the panel whether the the, the mayors are going to give any any comments on what you've just said as well. So thank you so much for your time today. All right. Bye. Thanks very much. We hope you can stay on. Yeah, and we hope you can stay on and listen to the rest of the conversation. But we appreciate you may you may have to get off. So thank you. Right. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. So that was really um, really great. I'm trying to gather up my notes now and see where we're actually up to. Um, but fortunately, I've got three mayors sat in a little screen below me, so I, I gather her onto the the panel for the mayors. Um, so this session um, is going to be looking. Um, obviously, we're going to hear from each of the each of the leaders, and we're still looking at this whole connecting people and places and what the north needs to to reset and to level up. And obviously, that's something that all of our um, our panelists have probably got a clear view on. So, with no more to do, um, I'm going to hand over to Steve Rotherham, who's the Metro Mayor of the Liverpool City Region. Steve, over to you. Thanks, Chair, and I think Baroness Via said that Metro Mayors are here to stay, which is good news for at least three of us on this call, and she wants to work with the region. But transport has to be about more than just infrastructure and joining geographical dots on a map. It's about connecting people with opportunity, and that's what we're trying to do in the Liverpool city region, and you'll have heard both Andy Burnham and I think Tracy's now talking about a London-style transport system. Uh, we're trying to do that in our city region, and, and that's because, let's face it, when we do go to the capital,
Not sure if we've lost Steve there. everybody so i think we have um temporarily lost steve there and he hasn't he hasn't been back on yet so um while we see if we can get steve reconnected i'm i'm gonna introduce our our newest metro mayor um tracy raven who's uh and literally i believe only been in post what it'll be two and a half weeks now just coming up for three weeks tracy so over to you thank you thank you so much and um don't blame me about Steve's text so that I haven't bumped him off the call so I can speak sooner. But uh, thank you so much for the invitation to be here. And thank you, Diva Connect and Transport for the North for organizing. As you say, um, two and a half weeks ago, I was humbled to be elected the first ever mayor of West Yorkshire and the first ever woman metro mayor in the country. And being born and raised in West Yorkshire, I love our communities and I'm deeply uh, privileged to be able to represent them. But that's also why I'm so ambitious for our region and for our future and why I believe we can achieve so much in the years to come. So I'm very pleased to have been sharing the stage with Baroness Beer alongside some of my other fellow Metro mayors. I'm pleased to hear how positive she is about working together. The frustrating part is that we've heard so many announcements from government and yet not a shovel in the ground. So I'm hoping the phrase, if you want anything done, ask a busy woman, that Baroness Vare will get over the line working with us as Metro Mayors. We have, as Metro Mayors, the power really to make big change for our communities and specifically on transport. We can be the champion for the views of passengers and the people living in our area to ensure that their needs are front and centre of all the decisions that we make and especially important coming out of COVID. Public transport will be the key to making sure our recovery from the pandemic is clean and green and absolutely fair and just and inclusive. And here in West Yorkshire, we're not just cities, we're also towns and villages and something Baroness Fear um, also identified the challenge of the, creating a transport network that works for smaller hamlets, towns and villages. And they rely on public buses. And I've got to confess, I absolutely love buses. I commute to work from Gummersall to Leeds um, to my job. And anybody from West Yorkshire will know that that can be a bit challenging. But as Grand Chaps has just said, actually, this morning, buses are the singlest, the greatest singlest used form of public transport, transport in the country, bar none. And he says, I tell that to people and they're amazed saying, I don't take a bus. And that is part of the problem because it shows the level of disconnect with our decision makers, strangers in Whitehall and Westminster, and the people who experience bus use, the everyday working people who use buses every day to get to work, to college, to see friends and to do shopping and so on. It's absolutely part of our DNA to use the buses. But we know bus use has fallen, not just because of COVID, but because of other issues, whether that's cost, uh, reliability, confidence in the service, overcrowding. These are challenges that, that I know the Metro Mayor can um, make a difference. Um, uh, we know that the um, they also support our poorest communities and we absolutely must prioritize that when we come out of this pandemic, making it that fair recovery. That's why in my first week, I was really pleased to sign off on an enhanced partnership with government, which will, will bring money to increase um, services, to uh, help with reliability, to get that better ticketing offer, to offer cheaper fares for youngsters uh, and, to, and to get people out and about using our buses and make it more efficient. But as Steve was going on to say, I'm also committed 
to uh, exploring bringing bosses back into public control, because surely that must be the best way to make bosses work for people and not profit. So there's big changes afoot, and I'm very proud to be leading the boss revolution, because we need a green alternative, and bosses are absolutely pivotal uh, to that solution. Um, but they must be attractive to uh, use and take people where they need to go and be affordable. And certainly our ambition is to put passengers and the passenger experience at the heart of the decision making. So we have a reliable bus service which offers real value for money. Also, we can't forget that it's National Walking Month, but for many of us, it's been National Walking Year, and we don't want to lose any of those improvements we've been able to get uh, when it comes to fitness and to tackle the climate emergency. Um, also, uh, that we've been able to implement over the COVID period uh, new technology, which has helped, which is real-time displays, a simple effective demonstration of how tech can improve the passenger experience. On rail, we've seen improvements. Um, the pandemic saw actual punctuality on the rail network, and that helps with confidence and use. But we must build on that. And where you have a regular service that you can rely on, that you can get a seat that is clean and green, then we have more passengers, and we must make sure that we continue rolling that out across West Yorkshire. Um, it's crucial, though, the government commits to and invests in major rail infrastructure upgrades right across the north. The Trans Pennine route upgrade, very welcome. The commitment to and support for Elland and for the um, uh, White Rose new station there. These improvements really are a long time coming. Lead station capacity improvements, the East Coast Main Line, HS2, Northern Powerhouse Rail. And as was mentioned, uh, we need to have that integrated uh, 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 rail plan please sooner rather than later. Um, also the announcement of new flexible season tickets and pay-as-you-go ticketing, supporting new working patterns where not everyone is in the office Monday to Friday, all very helpful, helping us modernize rail, but more is needed. If we're going to take this collective effort locally and nationally, we must all work together. Westminster government, metro mayors, combined authorities, uh, uh, council leaders, and obviously the public getting on board and being uh, involved in contributing their thoughts to our decision making. Because this is also about those ambitious climate targets that we've set here in West Yorkshire by 2038, we want to hit zero carbon emissions. We will only do that if we have a fantastic transport network system that is joined up, that is uh, easy to use, cost effective, with a tap in, tap out, fair, fair, that is capped in the same way that we see across London. So if I can say anything today, it is to government, please engage with Metro Mayors. We want to work with, with you. We want to help you deliver on your levelling up agenda. And uh, I know that certainly in West Yorkshire, we have a real energy commitment, positive um, uh, determination to deliver on that strategy. And we'll be very happy to work with government to deliver. And uh, it can transform the North. And hopefully I'll be driving it and working with government to do so. Thanks so much. And I hope Steve is back on the line and I look forward to hearing what he has to say. Thank you so much for that, Tracy. And, and congratulations again on your, your election, obviously. It was, a, it was a great win. It was all the way through. And it's obvious listening to you and listening to that energy and passion and enthusiasm, you know, to a great extent, why, why you, you got elected as, as mayor. So um, that was absolutely fantastic. And yeah, I, I loved your opening bit. Yeah, so many promises. We still don't have a shovel in the ground, so that's all great. And we've heard this and we've heard it and we've heard it. Can we get on with it now? I think it's the really big thing. And as you say, though, hopefully uh, Baroness Beer might be able to, to be that person that delivers. And the other thing that's really interesting, you commented on it a lot, was this thing that it is about working together. And I think actually here in the north with our mayors, we have some of the strongest voices. We need to make sure that we don't let the likes of the media make out that there's these clashes and conflicts when actually there isn't because that puts that puts people at loggerheads when it doesn't really exist because as you said the whole thing is we're all going to need to work together the mayors need to work with government government needs to work with the mayors and that's the way that we'll actually deliver this um and we, we just need to be careful i suppose you know because the, 
press don't like that. That sounds too nice, doesn't it? Does, that doesn't make for a good story. So we need to try and probably have a little bit of care at making sure that that doesn't happen to us. And we're not always seen as the people up here banging the table when that's not necessarily quite the way things are done. So great to hear that. So it looks like I was, I was about to go to Jamie, but it looks like Steve has come back to us. So hopefully he's going to be able to keep a connection. Uh, would you like to uh, would you like to try and carry on, Steve? I've not a clue where I was up to to tell you the truth, so I'm going to have to wing this because I um, I was trying to connect up the national stuff and the local stuff, you know, to say that we also wanted the London style transport system. And I haven't even heard Tracy, but I know Tracy is interested in what myself and Andy Burnham are trying to do with this because obviously we're ahead. Andy's nine months ahead of the Liverpool City region, but I, I was. Um, hoping that Baron SV might have been on just just to remind her that it is um, a problem with some of the legislation. And one of those pieces of legislation was the Bus Services Act 2017, which is just a it's an awful piece of legislation, in all honesty, because it doesn't make things easy. In fact, it in bits it's almost impenetrable and, and overly cumbersome and legalistic to try and get round um, some of the things that we want to do. So um, uh, if we can do that, that will speed things up. And that's the idea the, the Northern Acceleration, Transport Acceleration Council is about speeding things up. And um, that's what our aim is in the Liverpool city region too. But I'll, I'll, just, I'll, I'll just perhaps try in a couple of minutes to tell you about what we're doing locally, because it's not just about having a pop of government. You know, I've got manifesto commitments and we will re-regulate our buses uh, and we'll have that tap in tap out ticketing system um we will be doing token buses and daily fare caps and all the things that we want to try to equalize with what's happening uh, in places like london we are going to have mersey rail for all so new stations um further afield and in some of the left behind communities that baron sv was referring to but we're going to have new new stations in forgotten areas we also um, want to look at train, train tram technology uh, and see whether we can connect that up to our, our whole network. And we're going to continue to lobby government, and this is the important bit, which if, um, if I'm repeating it and it was um, included before it got cut off, great, because we need to re-emphasise re to the government that we won't accept a cheap and nasty option with the inter-city um, connection between Liverpool via Warrington to Manchester. And that cheap and nasty option is called 5.1, and it's absolutely not acceptable. And we just will not lie, lie down and, and allow the government to roll these things over on us. If we want to work in partnership, then we've already made concessions and we need a new twin track um, line. And that's because we need the additional capacity we are going to become more and more important to UK PLC as a western-facing port, and we need to get more freight onto rail and off our roads. And we've said that we could um, take 200 million miles of HGV traffic off our motorways every year if the government wants to work with us. So I'm looking forward to the Intercities um, Transport Fund, and it could be massive for us. We've already got half a billion pounds worth of brand new rolling stock. It's the most sophisticated and accessible in the whole country. And we want to, to see that um, extended wherever we can. Seven out of our 10 of our buses are low carbon at the moment. But we're putting in for um, a further fleet. We've got our first fleet um, coming in at the end of this year of hydrogen buses. We'll put in for some more. We want to try and take that up to about 50 odd. Um, we've got 600 kilometres of walking and cycling because active travel is really important as part of that integrated transport network. And, and we've got plans for new stations. One will be online um, probably in 18 months' time, and that'll be the second um, station. Um, one was about two years ago. This will be the second one already of my term, and they're the first two stations for over two decades in our city region and we're, we're refurbishing lots and lots of trains to make it a genuinely attractive alternative to jumping in the car we want people to ditch the car we want to reduce congestion we want to clean up the air we want to reach our net zero carbon targets but we can't do that on our own we need the government to work with us more and we need the powers that will enable us to do that but also 
the resources that other areas have had for many, many decades. And I'll leave it there, Chair. Thanks so much for that, Steve. Yeah, really interesting. I'm really interested to hear about the, the legislative problems. I don't think, I think it's like a lot of things when we look at uh, the, these kind of transport industries and, and local authority and national government, there's always this thing that people look and say, well, how hard can it be? And actually, it, it sometimes is a lot harder than you think because there's some little thing sat back there that is literally making it possible. So it's really interesting to hear about that. Um, and I'm telling you, with you, I have a personal interest in Wallington Van Cake, which is my kind of local station for the main kitchen network. So, uh, yeah, 5.1 is not a great option. Um, I'd like to see the, the, the full picture done. Um, and then, of course, as a, as a previous freight, um, uh, freight person and, and such, the, the fact that rail freight, you know, 200 million miles off the roads in HGV, which from a carbon perspective alone has got to be considered. So I think we have to have balance as we go forward about how much we we uh, worry about carbon on the railways versus carbon on the roads because one outweighs the other by far, far more. So it kind of will solve that carbon issue on the, rail, on the road. And then actually we've got a little bit longer to think about the railway because it doesn't contribute in the same way, etc. There's a lot of things to, to build in there, isn't it? But 200 million miles HGV office is just huge. You know, I know it's what it's 40 minimum 42 lorries per freight train that come off the road. So, um, you know, that's quite impressive. Right. So thank you for that. So um, we'll just hear for the last four panel speakers before hopefully having a little bit of time for some questions. Um, and I'm really pleased to introduce Jamie Justel, who's the Metro Mayor for North of Tyne. Hello, Jamie. Transport, there's... <laughs> are, we, are we on? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so when we talk about transport, there's there's two questions, really. There's what transport system do we want and how we're going to pay for it? Um, and that second one is the one that causes all the problems. It's a fundamental mistake in transport has been thinking about it with a market mentality. And it was really good to hear Charlotte talking about that shift, that chaos of different ticketing systems of bus companies racing and overtaking each other to pick up the passengers. We've seen it in the rail. We've seen it across the board. Transport is an enabler of everything else, so it does need planning, but it needs long-term planning. And that also means the funding of the people who are going to do the long-term planning. And at the moment, too much of that is in short-term competitive contracts uh, and competitions. So it's a bit like you're going to set off on your holidays um, and you get to the bottom of the road and you think, shall I turn left and right? And you don't know where you're going. So we really have to get to grips with this vision of the destination. We're locked into a car way of thinking. Um, you know, the planet is in the middle of a climate catastrophe. We uh, get all proud when we spend a few hundred thousand pounds on a bit of cycling infrastructure. Uh, we pat ourselves on the back. And then in the budget, the Chancellor of the Exchequer then gloriously announces proudly and 27 billion for tarmac. And there's a mismatch there. And I think everybody else can see that mismatch. You know, and that 27 billion, let's call it, for, call it for what it is, it's a subsidy for private cars. And you can't level up with concrete. We've got this idea that we, it's, it's OK to transport an 80 kilo human. On average, I'm a wee bit heavier, I'll concede that. An 80 kilo human in a 1500 kilo vehicle. And then you leave that 1500 kilo vehicle lying around all day and then you get back in it to drive home. I'm an engineer, the thermodynamics of that just don't work. It's not efficient. 48% of people on a lot of the journeys up here don't even have access to a car. So we talk about reopening the economy, but that economy, a large parts of it, are closed to half the population anyway. So we've got to get our mindset where we want to move people, not vehicles. So what would that look like? Well, it means mobility as a service, which anyone in the transport profession knows about, perhaps the wider public don't. But basically, you get one of these and you get everything on it. And uh, if you want to drive, and, and you know, I represent huge rural areas, we accept people are going to need to drive. You want to go to town, great. You can book your parking space so you know it's sorted, so you're not circling around town, creating traffic problems, trying to find somewhere to park. You want to just go somewhere, I'll say, well, actually, you know, if you cycle, this is where you can go. Or you can walk there and hire a bike for that stage of your journey. Or you can get on a metro or get on a bus. And by the way, your phone will take care of the ticket in and calculate the cheapest fare for you all the way. We want truly integrated travel so that you can take your bike for the first mile and the last mile and use perhaps uh, a bus or a train for that intermediary part or, or a e-scooter. 
Um, we need to change the way we fund things. The biggest barriers to things like cycling, people worry their bike is going to get nicked, <laughs> and understandably so. So let's invest in that. Let's invest in showers at work because they are part of the transport system. But we don't see it like that. And, and the, the accounting doesn't account for it in that way. What we want to get to is rock up transport where you can just decide, you know what, I'm going to go somewhere, the cinema, whatever, to a meeting, boom, get on this thing, they'll say, these are your options, so that it's as easy as walking out the front door and turning the key in your car. You can do that, and actually, what I would love to see, and we'll know we've cracked this, when on the coast road coming into Newcastle, there's a big sign-up that says, car journeys from Whitley Bay to Newcastle. 19 minutes bus journeys 17 minutes cycling 21 minutes and so people genuinely have that choice and then we can get it because the second question is you know i would, I would love it if we get 100,000 cars off the road in tyneside we have that system where you can say to kids who you know living in blythe get an offer of a job in team valley and they think oh the transport doesn't work and we say it's an integrated system all the, the bus gates are there everything all the traffic control systems intelligent enough to do it and we've got the technology and we can just say boom there you go kidder you can actually get to work or you're a care worker in work we can make it affordable for you that's what we really want because then you've got an inclusive transport system and a low carbon transport system so how do we pay for it part of the answer is better de deployment of the funding jim mcmahon talking earlier that uh, 66 billion is what in the north we've been underfunded we've got the lean sideline the, the reopening um, I think Tim Wood, I'm sure, will have been talking about it earlier. Um, and uh, the issue that the capacity on the East Coast mainline just isn't there. So we might have HSD, we might have Northern Powerhouse Rail. But unless we get that, that new system opened, we can't get it. But part of the answer is to fund revenue. You can't level up with concrete. Um, we've got new metro trains, but we still don't know whether we're going to have the funding to run them. Um, when the current funding runs out. So we need that long term. But the real missing components that people don't talk about is the fact we're already paying for this transport system. We're just in denial about it. It costs £4,600 a year to own and run a car. And most of that time, it's parking somewhere rusting. It's going to cost us £49 billion a year in obesity by 2050. That is largely as a result of the fact that we don't walk or cycle enough. We're losing squillions in lost economic activity. Every journey on the Tyne and Weir Metro generates £8.50 in economic revenue. If we re redeploy that money on second cars, and I've just sold my car, uh, and actually there's an acceptance of changing standards needing. So I went to a meeting yesterday, I cycled there, it was lashing down, um, in my black chino, it was not a suit, uh, with mud. And inevitably, up the front, and people are actually, that's fine. But at the moment, we have this attitude that you've got to be smart when you get in place. Let's just accept the reality that we are, you know, biological beings, and we're going to be dealing with an ecosystem, and it's okay to have a bit of mud on you if you've cycled somewhere, you know, and, and let's actually have showers places because we don't really want to deal with that. It's all right on Zoom, but not so much in person. And uh, we need to give regional transport authorities, such as MCAs, money raising powers particularly land value uplift so charlotte was right there is investment going in the we're reopening the northumberland line 162 million pound project the value of the land around that project is going to go up by more than the cost of the project and we're investing as a combined authority in all those economic supports around it but if we had the power to capture just that increase so you've got a field it might be worth £100,000. Put that railway line in, that field ends up being worth £5 million. Let's capture that uplift. Then we can, as Metro mayors, fund all the transport projects we want up front. Doesn't have to go through millions of grip schemes. Doesn't have to require us lobbying central government. We can just crack on with it. Get the investor safe. We will only level up when our fate is in our hands and that needs to be long term so we can plan because without this rethink we'll be here next year and the year after and the year after that asking why some people are stuck in traffic jams while others are trapped in transport poverty while type 2 diabetes is running rampant and while our planet is burning around us Thank you, Jamie. Um, and, you know, everybody can see there that that passion around the environmental elements of, of the transport thing is clearly um, is, is clearly very, very close to your heart. And if we have time, I, I do have a question to, to ask around that, but I'm just going to try and open up to the panel a little bit more initially. So I've got a, a question. So we want to get through a couple of questions, so please, everybody be, be 
relatively brief within your within your answers that we can get through a couple more questions would be great but i have got one for each of you um i'd like to know so what powers do you think you need to truly level up if you were to be if you were to be asked and i'll start with i'll start with tracy we'll go in the order we spoke with there so tracy uh, thanks very much. What powers? Well, at the moment, what's confusing is the powers of the Metro mayors are very different in different areas. So, for example, I take on the powers of the Police and Crime Commissioner, but I don't have powers over health in the, in the same way that Andy Burnham does. Um, uh, Dan Jarvis has different powers to me. So I think it's important that we get some sort of understanding um, across the piece of what the powers of the mayor are. Now, when it comes to transport, um, those powers powers um, are actually within our within our gift when it comes to uh, buses, for example, working with government and also the providers to make sure that we make we create a service that works. But as I've said to ministers on on calls and in forums like this, if you give us the powers and, and the money, Rather than dishing it out from Whitehall and Westminster, the, 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 the fund, the three billion pounds for buses is hugely welcome, but it is often uh, with the levelling up fund, for example, we are bidding against each other for a slice of that pie. So I think it would be really good to increase the powers of the mayor to work with government to say this is what we need to help you level up rather than us having to bid against each other. So I think it's it the power is is actually more about a conversation with government rather than saying please give it to us. Actually this is what we need and government then trying to make it happen for us. But as you know, having been in the job two and a half weeks, um, the powers are also powers of convening and persuasion and collaboration. So that's what I'm hoping to be able to do with government to um, build on my relationships in parliament to uh, ensure that we have the right people around the table who can help us unlock um, those powers to make things happen swiftly. But I'm sure Steve will have a different um, opinion about what powers are um, we're enabled to have. Uh, I'm very optimistic about those powers of persuasion, but maybe <laughs> I don't know whether uh, I'm on hiding to nothing there. Thank you, Tracy. Steve, do you want to come in then? Yeah, and I think Jamie will probably pick up fiscal devolution because he did mention it before, so uh, I won't go into that one. For me, um, it has to be about the whole skills agenda because even within transport, we keep on talking about we're going to build this, so we're going to build HS2, we're going to build Northern Powerhouse Rail, we're going to do roads, we're going to do hospitals, we're, going to, we're building everything, but we already know that there are skills shortages and skills gaps. And so that's where I think that the, the mayors can make the biggest impact in ordinary people's lives because what we could do is to try to better rebalance the supply with the demand of the future and that needs a strategic overview and there's only us who can do that in our areas because we know what's going to be happening in our own individual areas and we know that there's a pot of money through the apprenticeship um, funding that's being raised through the levy and that's largely um, not being targeted at the right things, the things that the government said it was raising that funding for. Look, I, I'm all for lifelong learning. I went back as a 29-year-old into college first and then ended up doing a master's degree. That's great. But there are different ways to fund that. And I don't think that the City of London should be sucking up apprenticeship levy funding under the guise those people do master's degrees and doctorates and all sorts of stuff um, when apprenticeship level uh, apprenticeship funding should be leveling up and it should be about giving hope and opportunity to people to get a foothold on a career in one of the industries that perhaps as metro mayors we will be able to reshape for our individual areas thanks Steve. Um, so, Jamie, I'm not actually going to ask you the same question because I have an audience member who's my only active audience member, so I'd like to keep encouraging him to post questions. Uh, and it is a very valid question, so I'm going to ask you for your opinion on the question in the chat. So, John Tilley's put the question in saying that while I agree with the suggestion to level enough powers for Metro mayors, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that large parts of the North 
are within the counties which have very little powers over transport and no money left in the coffers. That's a statement, obviously, but within that, you know, there is that thing. So what's your opinion on that? Uh, well, John's right. And um, actually, this speaks to what Tracy was. Tracy was right. Steve was right as well. Um, I don't have transport powers. So that is the mismatch across the metro mayors. That's why I'm trying to bring together the whole of the North East. So we can have trans transport powers. So the North of Tyne only covers half of the Tyne and Weir metro system. And uh, when it comes to money, it's what I want is not an endless supply of fish from Whitehall. I want a fishing rod. That's what fiscal devolution is. It's the ability for us to raise our own money, for us to be able to account for why we, in the public sector, um, we still end up largely having to fix problems rather than prevent them. And that's why I was talking about obesity earlier. That's why I was talking about land value uplift. And those things would work for counties, the work for metro mayors. I do think we need to be aligning these things on the functional economic area. So that's kind of the city region. And I know it's not the same across the country. Um, and there may be cases like Cumbria, for example, which is substantially different. But... Either way, those powers do need to come down to the local area. They do need the convening power. They need the fiscal devolution, things like land value uplift, the ability to transfer across different parts of the public sector. And that message lands well in Whitehall, that, that give us the fishing rod and we can fix these problems. Don't just keep giving us fish competitively where we have to argue with each other about it. We don't want to fight for the scraps from the king's table. We want our own table. Okay. Thank you for that. Right, so we really do have everyone out of time, although and I can't help but pose this question. Steve, I need to know. So clearly Jamie's got a sign to remind him he's a mayor and Tracy's got a necklace to remind her she's a mayor, but you don't seem to need reminding. So what is it? What's your secret for that? Uh, <laughs> you don't need to I've got a sign on the door that tells me and I've got a badge that's got my name on it. So that's my reminder. OK, great. I was just worried, you know, that you might wake up in the mornings and think, who am I and what do I do? Because clearly do and Jamie have got it nailed. <laughs> Absolutely right. Thank you. Thank you all so much for your time. Uh, it's, been, it's been great hearing from you. Congratulations to everybody on your re-elections. It's fantastic for us. It's fantastic for the North. We're really pleased to see you there. Bye for now. OK, everybody, so I'm not doing any better than catching us up. We have a fantastic lunchtime session with another group of speakers um, and uh, uh, just a conversation and chat over lunch. So we're going to, to only take a kind of two minute break. Please try and grab your lunch, bring it back, sit and eat it while you're listening to the kind of um, the, the conversation that we're going to have next. I'll see you in two minutes. Thanks.
Okay, two minutes. So uh, welcome back, everybody. I do hope um, that you've all had time to grab that sandwich or grab that coffee or whatever it is that you need to um, to settle down for our lunchtime session. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody to the Lunchtime Summit. That's uh, our, our audience and our, our participants. Um, and this is In Conversation with Northern Leaders, and it's sponsored uh, by Atkins. So we're going to have a big conversation, we hope, about how we build back better transport and better connect people and places across the north and lead the transition for green recovery. So there's not much on the agenda that we've got going up here. Um, as our first um, key note speaker in, in this session, I'd like to introduce uh, Councillor Susan Hinchcliffe, um, who um, hopefully are going to respond to that key question. Um, I'm going to ask each of you for your thoughts on how we can build back better, accelerate and reimagine the delivery of transport in the north. Over to you, Susan. Thank you very much for that. Um, pleased to be here. And interesting hearing the mayors as well um, are speaking together with a very loud voice talking about more powers and more funding uh, to the local areas. And I do, I'm a real devolution fan, and I think it's great that we've got so many northern mayors, and absolutely we need to make sure that that devolution accelerates over time. So, so for me, I think as a country, we need to accept that transport is one of the big three if we want to keep our uh, economy going and indeed accelerate recovery. So transport, skills, culture are my big three. If you get those three things right, then I think you can grow a successful place. If any one of them falls away, then I think you're left with issues and, and, and trench levels of poverty, which are going to be quite damaging to everybody, not just those people directly affected. So first of all, I think transport needs to be viewed nationally, and regionally and locally as one of the big three things that we need to get right uh, and that it needs to be a, a policy area that has an elevated level of importance with Treasury as well because of course it comes down to money doesn't it so I'm very pleased that in West Yorkshire now we've got our mayor and you've met our mayor online today um, who has got um, more funding and more powers than we've had before to do transport in the region and uh, the mayor has got very clear ideas about um, buses and wants to give a better service to the people that we represent. Often buses are the, um, the elements of transport that is um, left behind. It's not as sexy, it's not as exciting as a big train, but actually it is the level of transport that most people in our region rely on, and they need to see good bus services going to more places and to be better connected. Uh, and that, in my, my inbox, that comes up frequently from people wanting a better bus service. So um, that is what we need to get right. But of course, that does need more funding as well as more powers. I don't think we have to we have to view transport now as a public good. It's not something to run just efficiently that doesn't drag too much on the public purse. But if we want a successful economy and a successful society, we need to invest in our transport infrastructure, and that includes buses. Now. Having said that um, we haven't been dazzled by the big rail infrastructure projects, I do talk a lot about heavy rail that we need in the region, of course. So uh, HS2 going into Leeds, uh, that eastern leg is vital for us. NPR being delivered from Leeds to Manchester through Bradford City Centre. Uh, for Bradford, obviously I speak as Bradford leader now, is absolutely vital to our future prosperity as a place. We're the biggest city in the country, not on a mainline train line. And that cannot continue if that young population, that young population who are, are the workforce and the key workers of West Yorkshire and the wider north are to be connected to those opportunities. Um, so um, what we're waiting for at the moment is the IRP from government. Um, it could come any, any day now, any week now, or any month now, uh, depending on who you talk to. Um, it is important that all those key points that we want uh, funding are delivered in full, including transpan and upgrade, um, in full and not just piecemeal. Um, NPR and TRU do different things, and that needs to be acknowledged by government. And of course, then we look at walking and cycling. And uh, I know Jamie Driscoll was talking in the previous session about obesity. Uh, he's absolutely right. We need to make sure that uh, that level of transport is also put in and all interconnected, of course. So you've got walking and cycling, going to bus routes, going to heavy rail. And of course, in, in West Yorkshire, we've got big plans for West Yorkshire Mass Transit, uh, connecting the whole of the region, intra-regional connectivity. So 
my call on government would be to think long term on transport. Uh, it's not a levelling up bidding process. It shouldn't be. We all know in our regions what we need putting right on transport. This is going to take 5, 10, 15, 20 years. We should have that funding settlement in, in, play, in play. We should all be cited on what those are, are coming up. Uh, and Transport for the North, of course, has been instrumental in bringing that plan together. Um, but government needs to commit to that scale of funding over multi years so that we can plan ahead and make sure everybody's connected and everybody feels the benefit of prosperity. Because given where we are economically as a nation after the pandemic, that is going to be ever more important than it ever has been before. Thank you so much for that, Susan. And actually just on that <clears throat> on that last point, that you know, that planning ahead, it's something that, that we've asked questions about a number of times. You know, these big schemes come along and they take a a, a long time and during the period of those schemes um, the political landscape alters and that frequently leads us as a, as a nation in the position where we, we go back and we start re-looking at the, the schemes and you know I think there's been a lot more evidence put forward recently about how much that adds to the cost of um, the, the schemes what that does in terms of delay. In reality though in this country how do we do that? How do we set a long-term plan that says this is what we're going to do over this 20 years and get it to stay put is well it has to be a cost plan yeah no I, I think you're right and i've identified it frequently as a, an issue in that our democracy with fixed term parliaments doesn't always help that long-term funding does it i'm afraid so we have the transforming cities fund where we have to deliver um, transport transformational transport within a, a five-year term, and actually within a three-year term once the money came through, which actually, you can't deliver transport transformation within three years. It's just, you know, it's impossible. So that I do believe that all the major parties should come together and sign up to an agreement about transport infrastructure funding for the next 20 years, really, to say that we're all going to commit to doing that, because that certainty uh, of funding um, and that certainty of development would give the private sector the confidence to invest alongside those routes and would actually help our GVA and our productivity as a nation. But it does require confident leadership to think not just about their own political priorities, but to think about the nation uh, and everybody, whoever they vote for, needs to feel the benefit of living in this nation. Uh, and that requires all our leaders, both regionally and nationally, to live up to that confident, vision-led leadership that we all need to see at the moment. Thanks for that. Um, okay, so we've actually we've been joined by our our next um, panelist for this session, uh, Baroness Judith Blake. Um, hopefully, she can come in now. And um, I'd like to ask, sort of, pose the same question to to her, please. How can we build back better, accelerate and reimagine the delivery of transport in the north, Judith? I don't think that we've still got any sound from her. I'm looking at her, she looks like me. And so in the meantime, um, while we try and get Judith connected, I'd like to introduce Richard Coburn from the sponsors of this session, Atkins, um, and ask if you've got any questions to pose to Susan as well. I thank, thanks, Debbie. I'd very much yeah, build on what uh, Susan has outlined there about the kind of the, the essential, although it sounds very obvious, is, is to take a take a long term approach, and certainly the work that we've been doing with UK uh, Twenty Seventy Commission and One Powerhouse Consortium uh, is that take, taking a I think giving giving spatial planning a, a, an honest and 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 a clear go at, at providing a platform for 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 doing some of this this um, prioritisation. And when we look, talk about spatial planning, we're not talking about, um, you know, a new new layer of, of regional government or uh, something that's focused very much on on land use and, and transportation, but something that that is cross boundary, that is is cross sector sector, and uh, and something that is very much long term in its in its focus uh, that can transcend the kind of the political fluctuations that that is an essential part of of, of day to day life. Um, so so we, we think that. You know, spatial planning does provide a basis which you can kind of establish longer term priorities and focus on those priorities. And, you know, it's, it's all about collaboration, not competition. And I think 
you know, spatial planning provides a basis in which, you know, you can make those linkages across sectors and across boundaries. Um, and, you know, one of the, 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 the challenges at the moment is that, you know, we're faced with very short term approach to, to funding, you know, and, uh, the, the, you know, the funding regimes are so competitive, so so, so, so rapid. I mean, we're going through at the moment where we've got the levelling up fund, we've got the uh, communities fund, we've got the towns fund. And uh, local authorities are faced with rapid turnarounds to compete for these funds and to establish their priorities very quickly and to to, to bid against each other. Whereas I think giving spatial planning, and you know, a chance, you know, to to establish collaboratively what these priorities are and to stick to them in the long term. So I think that's that's the kind of the that, that's kind of our our view of, of things and and trying to cut across the. The kind of the the, the, the the kind of the short termism that that is is defined by the funding at at, at the moment. Thanks for that. Um, Susan, are you still with us? I'm hoping you are. Yes, I'm still here. Oh, yes, and I think Judith just arrived as well. She has. So I think if I'm right, Susan, can I just check? I know that you have to leave us, don't you, um, a little bit early for this session. No, no, I'm, so... I'm here for the whole thing. You don't have to worry about me. Oh, absolutely. okay, that's absolutely great then. In that <laughs> case, yeah, I don't know whether you want, before we move to Judith then, I don't know whether you want to make any comment back to Richard um, and then we'll move over to Judith. Yeah, I mean, I think um, we're waiting for the outcome of uh, planning considerations from governments, aren't we? I think uh, the concern in the planning white paper was that combined authorities didn't have an awful lot of mention in there uh, and uh, i'd like to see any reiteration of uh, planning legislation in the future to have sight of combined authorities and what we're trying to do at regional level which is plan transport infrastructure between each other you cannot plan transport just within bradford boundaries otherwise we'd have a different gauge when we got to leeds and that'd be no good um so um we we all need to be connected and, and we recognize that as planning authorities that we need to have due regard to each other when we're planning such major infrastructure and government needs to do the same. And you mentioned climate emergency as well. Uh, that also needs to be something that um, planning legislation is cited on. So um, the future planning work that is coming forward from government, I want to see combined authorities mentioned in there more and climate emergency because that's, that's going to be the two pressing things that we're going to be grappling with at regional level going forward. And they, they need to reflect the present day challenges that we all face. Maybe we can't hear you. Okay, that was the first time I've done that today, so I have to be forgiven for that, okay? Um, and I've been here since 10 o'clock, so it's the first time I've spoken without that. So apologies, everybody. So Baroness Judith Blake, welcome. I'm glad you could get connected with us. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kick off with the same question that, that Susan sort of spoke about at the beginning on, and how we can build back better, accelerate me imagine the delivery of transport in the world. Thank you. Um, good afternoon. Can you all hear me? Yeah, yes. Okay, thank you. This is an, a very unusual format. I'm so sorry I missed Susan's um, input. First of all, um, I do have a slight problem with the build back better um, terminology because I think we're facing an incredibly challenging time and I'm not sure that that really does reflect some of the seismic changes that we need to um, really be considering to respond post-COVID, post-Brexit all of those um, those issues that need to come in. So um, in terms of um, the infrastructure transport, the development that we need to bring forward, I just repeat the, the mantra. And I'm, I'm, I'm actually very heartened. I, I was in a debate in the House of Lords and Baroness Veer kept repeating the mantra about putting the passenger first. And I think that um, has really come out of the work that we did at Transport for the North, responding to the timetabling disaster, if you if you recall, and the work we did um, through the Blake Jones Review, um, really assessing what had gone wrong and why it had gone wrong, and and very pleased that um, government is picking up that um, additional need to do better in really in terms of um, recognizing the patterns, and we didn't know at that time 
the seismic um, impact that the COVID pandemic would bring. And we still really don't have clarity in terms of what it means in terms of behaviour and what the demand um, flows will be like as a result of that. But I think the, the, the basic points need to be re-emphasised. We had a real setback at Transport for the North in terms of being able to work more on the integration side. And um, I think what we're being offered at the moment is a, a pale shadow of what our ambition was at the very beginning when we started off on this journey. But we, we you know, I think, um, as I'm sure Susan um, will have said, you know, at um, the West Yorkshire level, we've offered ourselves as a pilot in this area. I think we're ahead of the game in many of um, the, the uh, you know, the areas of work that we've been doing, and um, we need to put a really put some pace behind this in terms of regaining the confidence of passengers who, you know, will require a lot of um, encouragement to get them back on to the system. Um, um, and I think we need to really focus on accessibility and the, its broadest um, con context. And that you know, very very important news around work on the stations. Um, but you know, we've been talking about this for some time now, and um, you know, it's disappointing that we haven't had more progress here. But accessibility is absolutely critical, and accessibility not just in a physical sense, but also in terms of affordability and the proper pricing plans, fares plans, so that we do have the opportunity to really reach out and, and attract new um, new users. And I think that's going to be really important. Um, so, of course, um, we're very conscious of um, the investment needs. And I think, I think we really have got across the argument around the um, spatial inequality, um, just how um, let down we've been in the North by investment decisions over a very long period of time. Um, so we we have a very clear prospectus in terms of moving forward and we, we've we really resisted over a long time the sense that this is a pick and mix agenda. It isn't. It, we need to see the investment in full. Um, so right down from a very local level, as I've suggested, but going right through into the big infrastructure plans around HS2 East and West, commitment to both those in full, um, NPR with Bradford, um, uh, stop in Bradford is absolutely critical in our ambition moving forward. But then how we get the connectivity from this um, investment um, how do we actually make sure that all communities benefit from the investment? Um, mass transit, absolutely key. Uh, very pleased to to understand that you know there is some movement going forward around this, but we still are waiting for um, the details. So, as well as um, the, the 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 you know the the physical issues, we haven't really had a very clear plan of the impact on the skills programs um and you know we're we we're recognizing across so many sectors of skills shortage as a result of brexit of oh, clearly there are international discussions around how we can recruit more widely um but we need to make sure there's a, a home-based skills program in place right now you know to put the um to get the progress that we need we need to start planning now for the decades of work ahead of us um and also a recognition that at the moment we're already suffering from materials basic material shortages in the construction industry what are we doing around this to make sure that we have the plans in place? And it sounds from the bit I heard when I came in that you have already touched on the implications of the climate, um, the climate um, emergency, the climate agenda, um, how we can really make sure that we use everything that we're planning to do as an opportunity to urgently um, address the, uh, this and the targets that we have in place 
um, and how um, how we can move this forward and really um, get real um, confidence and enthusiasm about the work that we need to do in the public um, public sector in the public transport agenda. And this isn't just about rail; it goes right across the piece and how we actually convince people um, that they don't need to use their cars um, and, you know, how, how can we achieve this? So um, I'm always very struck by the UK 2070 piece of work um, and their call for a connectivity revolution. So where is the urgency? Where is that real sense of pace and change that we need? Um, and we need to have really new commitment to the projects that we've got in place. We have had some repeat um, commitment to projects that have been in the pipeline for a long time. I think now is the time that we need to see government stepping up and giving us the certainty so that we can move forward with confidence, energize the business community um, right across the north in terms of what what is coming and what the potential actually is. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. Um, that was really interesting to hear. I have um, on the phone, um, I have uh, Professor Vincent Goodstadt, who hopefully can hear us on the phone. I just wondered, having listened to, to Susan and, and Judith, whether you've got anything you'd like to add into the conversation today, Vincent? Well, thanks very much. I hope you can hear me. Uh, sorry that you can't see me, but maybe you're better off for that. Uh, the, first of all, it's really, I can only but endorse everything that Judith has said so clearly, in particular, the fact that this, two things that struck me particularly. One is that it, this is not a pick and mix uh, approach. It is a comprehensive approach to the issue, which is not only about transport, but the labour market that it serves, the industries it serves, uh, and a whole range of other activities. But also, that in many ways, we know in the North, and I've looked at the various reports that have been done across the North, where the local communities actually have a perspective. They know what they would like to achieve. And it's a question, therefore, about delivery. And I'm struck by the point that's been made several times this morning that this uh, is not new. Well, I was reading this morning a, a report, and it said this. It said, there is a new confidence in the north of England. New proposals to build, to build and its confidence need to be brought forward to harness the untapped potential for economic growth in the north of England along key economic and transport corridors. The only thing was that this was written 20 years ago in a thing that we probably all forgot about called the Northern Way. The mm -hmm. objectives, the goals, the many of the ideas have been there for so long, and it, therefore the heart is why have they not been delivered on to date? And we know the reason. The report that Jude has referred to of the UK 2020 sets out those core things which have to do with the need to change the way we do things. And the, including uh, behaviour attitudes, which have been touched on, uh, for example, in the attitudes to buses, and also the need for new forms of partnership. And I think that what needs to do is a greater clarity of, 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 of a purpose and the fact to recognise that, the, like COVID, like Brexit, like, uh, like in fact the zero carbon agenda, they actually are coming together to actually create a new narrative for the UK. And in many ways, the agenda that we're all aspiring to at today's conference needs to be set in a collective revolution, not just for the North, but across the country, which is a context for the new global role of the UK. It actually is about where this whole country goes. And it transforms the argument, and it needs to, from not just being a North-South argument or towns or cities, or a beauty contest in the Olympics, but actually one in which we need to see that total uh, awareness and ownership of the, the fact that the answer and the future of the UK lies in the North. And it is a, a, has been a driver in the past in innovation, in the early revolution, industrial revolutions, and it can do that again. And so 
when it comes to transport, and if I pull out three particular big ideas that need to be here, there's a lot of discussion going on around the Hendy Review and a pan-UK network. Well, that has to be more than just the old EU pa uh, trans-European network. It has to see that the core network is not just the high-speed rail, but those key links to it, to the major areas, whether that's the Tees Valley or Merseyside and so forth. And secondly, it's that we need to actually say we want all our major cities and towns, and we actually put a figure of 150,000, which is not very high, to all have a very clear long-term transit network for transforming it to the quality of transport networks that they have in most European cities. And the third one is actually recognizing those areas that are beyond our cities and towns the, 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 the more peripheral ones. And the work we've done has highlighted the severe problems along the east coast and part of, 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 of the north and other parts of England, which are at disadvantage in their own way, fundamentally because of their transport needs. So I think we start to think on those scales and actually talk about outcomes where we're saying the north has to have the same quality of transport systems and connectivity as is in the south both between cities and also within them, then we start to put some concrete measures on whether that levelling up is going to be achieved. So this is you those thoughts, uh, uh, but they really are reinforcing everything that's been said today and saying it needs to come together as a kind of coherent long-term strategy, which is actually for the country, not just for the North. Thank you. Thank you for that, Vincent. And Judith or Susan, you've got any, could you hear that OK? Yeah, have you got any yes. comments? Um, yeah, would you like to make any comment there? Um, no, just um, just to um, wholeheartedly endorse um, what Vincent was saying. It's so, it's so powerful. And um, I think we're going through a very interesting period in terms of um, what is proposed in the devolution agenda from now on. And I, 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 I was expecting the Williams... Um, report to have more about um, regional um, ownership of the agenda and um, that seems to, all that element seems to have been diluted and I think there is a real concern about what is proposed and obviously enormous questions about um, how the leveling up agenda is going to be realized and what the what the basis of it actually is so I don't think the um, the appetite, around the country for more local um, um, powers and control, and particularly the whole issue about resourcing, will go away. I think the gene is out the bottle, and um, I think there are so many different areas where we have demonstrated that if we are allowed to get on and control the agenda, we can do so much more. So looking forward to um, some of these um, debates continuing, but... Um, I think there are uh, probably more questions than answers out there at the moment. So this um, this debate is absolutely critical, and we need to make sure that there's a collective understanding from right around the country that, that we're not pitting ourselves against any other part of the country, that we all have our unique issues and problems to deal with. Um, but uh, uh, I think there's a, a real understanding that that we can do, we could be doing so much more if um, if we were allowed to do so. Yeah, I, I'd agree with that. I mean, um, it's mentioned about um, to why the Northern Way wasn't as successful, and you know, transport for North will it be more successful? And I, I think the answer is you have to follow the money, don't you? So if if the money and powers are given to the North, then we will act and we will spend it according to Northern priorities. But if we constantly have to go go to Westminster with a begging bowl and compete on a beauty parade about missing bits of money for bits of projects when we're wanting really long-term investment, then we're going to set ourselves up for failure. So um, I do think it's watching where the money is decided and who spends that money. It shows how serious government are about devolution. And we know that in Europe we're the most um, disadvantaged in terms of gap between rich and poor in the whole of Europe. And, and I put that roundly down to the fact that we're very centralised as an economy. Uh, and that has to change if we want to see that health inequality gap narrow. Um, and I'm really serious about that. 
Yeah, thanks, Matt. This morning we've actually had a, a couple of views. You know, some of the um, some of the viewers being that uh, the government don't like having let the devolution agenda, you know, out of the bottle or the devolution genie out of the bottle. Um, Baroness V are very much stating that you know she absolutely thinks um, it's been the right thing to let the devolution agenda progress and that you know it can continue to progress. So we've had some uh, different views through this morning as well. Um, I'm going to come to Richard in a minute, see if he's got any questions that you'd like to ask you a bit, um, just why he thinks that. So remind everybody, if you do have any questions, please post them in the chat box. Um, but one for you, I think, Susan, um, and I know that you can probably answer this extremely eloquently, but it is interesting for people to really understand what this does. So the question is about how could transit-orientated development at locations where stations are being developed, and obviously I'm, I'm thinking about the Bradford station with this, or redeveloped, provide those living opportunities and promote good growth. And um, how does that, that type of project do that? So I, I think I see that absolutely in that if you decide to put a, a station in Bradford St. James's site, which is where we'd like to put it, immediately the land values around there go up. It becomes a better development opportunity uh, and really starts to regenerate and accelerate the local economy. I think what has been understated for many years at government level is the um, power of investment in transport to regenerate economically and socially the places where you put that investment. So uh, historically, it's been about journey times, uh, how many people you can fit on a train, etc. And, and now I think there is a wide acknowledgement that that social and economic value of tra transport investment is vital. But there's still some argument about how it's quantified. Uh, and I don't think we're clear enough yet about being able to um, show how that um, algorithm, if you like, or that calculation is compared and put alongside transport journey times and capacity. Uh, and so I think we're quite new at doing that yet, but I think it's really clear that that is a massive consequence. I lead uh, our neighbouring city, and something Judith knows well, uh, is a very successful core city with a, a train line that goes right into the heart of it. And I do believe that has been a major point of success for, for Leeds uh, and has been benefited it many times over. Um, we need to see that good connectivity in more places. And as it, it doesn't always have to be a major train line going through it, obviously, but transport connectivity leads to better economic success for communities and so better social interaction connected in so many ways. Can I, I know Vincent would also like to come in on this, so I'll ask him in a moment. But I have one sort of follow-on question for you, and I know that with some of the authorities I'm involved with, we've been, this has been a question that's been, been considered. One of the things you said, for example, was that classic idea that the land value automatically sort of increases, and it does. You know, we see that happen. How do you make sure that um, sometimes the lag of your, for your local community that people don't get almost priced out, that still get the chance to stay? to stay engaged, to actually benefit the, the local people that are currently in, in often, you know, economically poor conditions. How do they make sure they don't end up left behind by that growth that comes along? So I think it's a whole package of investment in regeneration, isn't it? As I started out by saying, um, transport is one of the pillars, but actually skills is another key thing as well, actually. So we have to invest a lot more in skills than we're doing at the moment. And there is some good work that government have funded, like through Kickstart, for example, but that's only a really small drop in the ocean about the difference we need to see. If we're going to become globally competitive, then we need that skills investment. So we, we can... Obviously, through um, brokering connections with existing businesses and uh, making sure you put money in to uh, increase their capacity to get more land and to employ more people, that, that's something you can do in the short term. But actually, we need to equip our citizens with the right skills to be able to benefit from the investment we're making. And we cannot, as I say, we... We cannot cut back on um, the investment in our most precious asset, which is our people. And if you don't invest in our people, then we will never fully realise the benefit of transport infrastructure investment. OK, thank you for that. Um, Vincent, I know you'd like to come in there as well. Yeah. Yes, yes, if, if I may. In, in, there have been two questions raised since I, I want to, well, a further question raised since I said I'd like to respond. The first one, if I deal with, which was your last question about how do we do it in a way that doesn't leave the most disadvantaged people just as disadvantaged or worse off. 
And I, I agree with Susan. It's actually, I think it was Susan who was talking, I can't see. But, to, but in fact, it's about skills and a whole range of other things. And the other things that I, I would want to be put on the table that should be treated with equal urgency is the environment that people have to live in, the quality of environments, housing conditions, the, the fragmented housing markets which disadvantage people, and also what is I've seen now as growing importance is what's what referred to as the local economy, the foundational economy. And if you uh, look at the work that's been done in Wales, they, they're paying serious attention to that and looking at new ways of actually recognising that when you're dealing with the, the local economy, you need different rules of engagement. You need to allow people to, to fail, for example, and, and not be criticised, as it were, for trying new things in areas where the market has failed to date. You also, in your first question, asked me about the money, and it's all about money. I think it's... It's not just simply about there not being enough money. Um, I mean, there isn't enough money put into infrastructure. What we do in the UK is a fraction of what the average OECD country puts into infrastructure. And we, in our report, talk about raising the, the percentage of the UK economy that's spent to something like 3% a year, which we massively increase. Now, the advantage of putting a more significant amount on the table is you don't have the same beauty contest where equally deserving schemes for, for transfers, as I've seen between northern cities, have competed with each other when they both need to be invested in. And so there is this question of scale. And the second part is actually from experience of other countries, and I've worked in, uh, in, uh, in many places, uh, in many places like Barcelona and in the Netherlands and in the, the rest of the, of the northeast of America. But what's critical and makes a difference is having what actually Richard talked about at the beginning, which is a spatial plan, and a clear idea of what will happen when, but also where. And having that creates actually its own argument. We're in a catch-22. Because there isn't the money, we don't do things, and therefore there isn't a case. You have to actually make the case to create the, the money to be unlocked. And my experience of here and elsewhere is that if you do that and have that clarity of, of spatial plan, you create the argument for the unlocking of resources. Because in the end, the money we're talking about will bear fruit money, in many ways. For example, it reduce benefit cost in, in terms of uh, pressures on all sorts of services and so forth, as well as tax and tax incomes and so forth. And then in that, we also have to build in a totally different approach to the way we harness the value from the uplift in value of land created by planning decisions by the public sector. The public sector is creating value in land, which too much goes back into the pockets of those who own the land and not into the community who have actually created the value, and actually have to deal and live with the consequences of that development. And we need a new approach. And we've done that successfully in other places, for example, in Newtown. That's why Milton Keynes is so successful. That's why Warrington is so successful, because it had a different model by which they, they funded the investment. I'll just leave you with those thoughts. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you so it. much, Dr. Um, yeah, Richard, would you like to come in? Um, on some thoughts on that. Yeah, I think, I think there's a fairly fundamental issue that of, of, of and I know it's, uh, it's been well kind of rehearsed before, but one of the, the key issues is, is that, you know, we, we can't, you know, when we're talk, talking about levelling up and about stimulating growth, you know, we, we can't look at transport in isolation and, uh, you know, we've, we've got to, whenever it comes to using transport as a neighbour for growth, whether it's for using uplift and value or for just stimulating housing and, and local economic growth, then you know the transport schemes need to be planned in in integrated in integrated manner with 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 land use planning and with with other uh, key priority local priorities and certainly the green book uh, the new green book is very much has a, a new emphasis on on on, on places and uh, getting away from uh, BCRs which obviously has driven transport investment historically. Uh, over, over recent years, and um, you know that, that, that I think that's, it, it creates lots of challenges in doing that. But I think to do it honestly, um, you know, it, it takes a much broader approach. Uh, I know, obviously, the example that I'm going to give is not the north of England, it's in the south of England. But if you look at Ebb's fleet, um, hopefully there's not 
<laughs> there's nobody from Ebbsfleet here, but um, it just one you know did not stimulate growth in Ebbsfleet. Uh, what we're having to do is retrofit growth in in and around HS1 and Ebbsfleet. So um, I think the North has an opportunity to do that, and uh, I think as a, as a second point to that agenda is that uh, we do talk about increased connectivity, not just north to south, but also within the north. But that should also include not just city to city, but also linking up uh, smaller cities and, and towns within the north, you know, to, to create those opportunities. And I think the, I know we've got city mayors on the on the, on the line here on the panel, but, you know, I think there's a, there's a, been a, a strong focus on the, on the city regions for obvious reasons, but there's a, also a benefit for the, for the, for the whole of the north is, is to link up the, you know, the, the vast amount of economic opportunity there is in, in the smaller cities and towns th through increased uh, connectivity. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that, Richard. Um, okay, so I think so we, as we, we begin to also close, we're going to run this slightly over because we ran all the other sessions over, so let me we get all, all full things. I would like to go to um, to, to each of the panellists um, to see if you've got any, any final closing comments you, that you'd like to make. Um, and I'll, I'll start with Baroness Judith Blake, please. Oh, um, thank you, thank you, and and thanks for the opportunity of of coming on the call. And I think the um, the whole um, issue around how we stimulate growth um, to the benefit of local communities is one that probably hasn't been explored enough. There are various levers that we can use, and in Leeds we um, were very a very early adopter of using planning um, planning gain um, linking to the, the skills agenda and making sure that there were obligations on businesses coming in to actually explore um, the local employment market and putting resource into training schemes um, to make sure that local people in local communities were able to access the opportunities that were being created. I, I don't think we've looked at this in anywhere near enough um, detail, but certainly in Leeds, we always took the approach that we wanted to uh, make sure that the benefit coming in was shared with with um, local communities. And it, it's a very vexed and fraught issue. Um, and certainly, um, where housing development has been um, one of the areas that has come from investment. Um, I, I'm afraid we have seen too many cases where the prices of those houses have just um, meant that they're out of reach for people in the local communities. And I think we've all got an obligation to look at some of that practice where it hasn't brought benefits to the local, local people, local communities, and has led to some real, real concern um, around, around that area and how we can do it better how we can actually look at examples where we have made sure that the increase in growth and regeneration, as Susan said, has brought immediate benefit to local areas. And, that, you know, I was very struck when I did, um, had a tour around all of the um, developments around King's Cross, built around the development of the station itself and just how much effort went in to making sure that the local existing communities felt part of that development. And I think it's it's schemes like that that we need to look at. We need to learn from good practice, and we need all of us to have a real commitment to making sure that we're not talking about growth um, at any, uh, any, any cost. It needs to bring benefit to our communities and we need to understand the connections between different communities as we've highlighted throughout this conversation today that it's not just based on on um, a city structure for example but recognizing that you know growth within our cities can bring enormous benefit if it's handled correctly to a much much wider area i think there's some good work that has been undertaken but we need to do a great deal more and we need to convince um, decision makers around the country of um, just how 
important this work is. And um, it, it goes back to that central point um, of um, place, um, local local determination, investment in local areas, and um, with local partners having a very key and important role in determining how we move forward. Thank you for that. Yeah, I mean, you know, you've referenced, I suppose, what we, many of us recognise as one of the most iconic stations that we've developed in the UK in recent years. And you're right, just amazing how they've managed to take account of the communities. And of course, how, you know, you, what Susan was saying earlier, how the regeneration has brought in such huge amounts of private investment as well to help develop everything that's gone on around the area. And, you know, in my mind, it's, it's definitely one of my favourite stations, despite it being in the South. Um, and it is that one that I think, you know, we should be holding up to say that's what, you know, that's what we want to try to create. Um, and but as you say, lots of care to say, you know, how do you make sure that you don't leave your local community behind all this? I mean, what happens as we do that? Um, and that's not, it's not easy to manage, is it? So thank you very much for that, um, Judith. Uh, Susan, have you got any, any closing comments that you'd like to make? Yeah, I just leave you with two things. First of all, um, following on from the conversation we just had, um, if you are somebody working in development who's, uh, whether it's transport or outside transport, actually, um, being able to quantify the social value, social and economic value for that community, I think is really useful. If you've got case studies of that, please publish them. If there's some work you're doing in terms of research about um, the value of transport investment, in particular, to social and economic regeneration of that community where it lands, then I think that's really valuable in making the case because I, I don't think the Green Book work that's been done cut in there, it needs to... It needs to be more proliferate. It needs to become part of everyday life that policymakers are thinking about all the time. So you have to kind of, you have to keep raising the profile of that value of work. Really, the social and economic impact of transport investment. Let's keep on quantifying that. Um, if you can't measure it, it doesn't work, does it? People like numbers and they like to measure things. So and I'm afraid I'm one of those people, but I like to think government should be as well. I think the second thing I'd like to say is as a region, we need to be bold and confident about our transport ass. Um, we should never, ever get into um, a situation where we're arguing about HS2 or NPR. Why do we have to choose any of that stuff? So we, we all need to speak up for each other and make sure that in Westminster, because I'm afraid in Westminster is still where a lot of these big decisions are made, that in Westminster, the business voice of the North is heard loud and clear that it is absolutely right time now for investment in Northern infrastructure, particularly in transport, but across all different spheres. Uh, and that voice needs to be heard because actually what politicians do care about is votes. And if they realise there's lots of votes in the north around transport and getting it right, then they will act on your concerns. So politicians can do so much, local politicians and regional politicians. But that business voice also needs to that clamour for more investment in transport in the north. And let's not pick and choose about which bits we want first. Thanks, Susan. And yeah, you're absolutely right. So politicians want votes. And I think that's why there's a lot of hope of here in the north that actually we are going to eventually see the money following those promises because otherwise that's going to change the whole dynamic next time around. So those people who have now said, yes, we're going to do it, um, with, there's a lot of hope in the North that they're going to follow through with that, isn't it? So, um, so just very, very briefly, I'd like to just ask Richard, as, as you know, Phil Atkins is sponsor of, of this lunchtime session, whether he wants to give a couple of closing comments before we, we wrap up and I and let everybody know how to access the mini summit. Thanks, Debbie. No, I think I think the only thing I would say really is 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 just I think in, in the north is is continue along the path that that that, that is that is, has been started, in, particularly in terms of the, the the kind of immense collaboration that has that has taken place across what is a, a very large large geographical area. And I think I think uh, it's it's that kind of spirit of collaboration rather than competition is 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 is, is a key to to maybe countering some of the the, the centralist kind of uh, forces of, of, of Westminster and um, you know I, th I think that, that that means like any relationship a bit of give and take and help collectively establishing what your strategic priorities are in different uh, different uh, parts parts of the north uh, I know it's easier said than done but uh, and it maybe sounds a little bit naive but certainly um, uh, that's that's what I'd like to think uh, it's going forward that, that that the north has really established could 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 reap 
enormous rewards. Thanks. So um, we are about out of time now. So uh, Councillor Susan Hinchler, Baroness Judith Blake, um, Rich Coburn, Matkins, and not forgetting, hopefully I've still got um, Professor Vincent Goodstat on the phone. Thank you so much for your time today and for sharing your insights. Um, it's been, been fantastic. Um, thank you, thank you very much. Right, so to our audience, uh, we're gonna move into the mini summits next. Um, hopefully you can see on your screens um, uh, four little boxes up on the right hand side. And if you click the button below the mini summit image on the screen, you'll be able to access the mini summit that you um, you've registered for. If they're not on the screen, there is an icon at the bottom of the page that you should be able to click on. And we have actually also put those links in the chat. So hopefully everybody will be able to make their way to the mini summits. Um, I've, I've really enjoyed sharing the, uh, the panels this morning. What an amazing lineup of speakers. I hope it's been helpful for everybody here and enjoy your afternoon through the summits. Bye.